Dear distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to all of you on this hot, late summer day in Brussels. We have gathered here at these premises of the Central Bank of Belgium for an equally hot topic, I have to say, a digital euro for a digital era. It is the very first time that we have brought together in the European capital so many experts to share their research, their insights and opinions about central bank digital currency for Europe. This event will provide an opportunity to exchange views on the digital euro and to deepen the understanding of the rationale and the potential benefits of the digital euro, as well as the key challenges that are still ahead of us. Purpose is that by lunchtime, when this conference is scheduled to come to an end, you will be able and you will be all up to speed with the latest developments and the various points of view. We organize this conference on the eve of an important decision-making moment. The European Central Bank has publicly announced that a decision on the next phase of the Digital Euro project will be taken in early autumn. The initiative to organize this conference was jointly taken by the Central Bank of Belgium and our friends from Austria, the Österreichische Nationalbank and the Banque Nationale de Belgique, the Nationale Bank van België. I'm happy to introduce the first speaker of today, Mr. Pierre Wunsch, the governor of the Central Bank of Belgium and also an ECB governing council member, and he will share some opening remarks with you. Uh, thank you, Geert. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me warmly welcome you to this conference, a digital euro for the digital era, which I'm happy to host here in Brussels, indeed, jointly with my colleague, uh, Governor Halsman uh, of the Österreich uh, um, uh, National Bank. My name is Wunsch, so yes, my grandfather was Austrian. Uh, I don't know if it played a part in us organiza organizing this conference together, but uh, I just share a number of anecdotes with Robert and others uh, before we started. So co-hosting this conference uh, with our Austrian colleagues is a token of the excellent collaboration that exists between our central banks, also here in the capital of our union. And I, I must say, Robert, on, on monetary policy, we are probably on the same, on the same side of the spectrum. Uh, the topic of our conference today uh, is, of course, a very important one a potential introduction of a digital euro in the form of a retail central bank digital currency or CBDC would constitute a major project for the euro area and the euro system. But it is also a major challenge. It would change significantly the form in which central bank money is made available to the wider public and represent an evolution at least as significant as the introduction of the euro banknotes more than 20 years ago now. Precisely because it would be a major step for our common currency, we should not tread lightly or rush matters. There is no urgency as such. As Governor Holtzman will surely also attest to, we have already held multiple dedicated in-depth discussions on this topic with uh, the European Central Bank's Governing Council since the start of this project's investigation phase almost two years ago. It is important in my view, and by the way, when I say in my view, the man in charge here at the National Bank is Tim Hermans. I think Tim is going to close the conference today. So if there are lobbyists in the group, in the room, and I'm sure there are lobbyists in the room, officially or non-officially, please don't call me, call him. We accept uh, gifts below 50 50 euro. Um, so in my view, it is important to stress that central banks should not be the only drivers of this project. Our common currency uh, and what form it takes, physical or digital, touches all our daily lives, not just those of central bankers. The finance ministers of Eurozone member states have discussed the topic within the Eurogroup in depth and multiple times already. I also cannot but strongly emphasize the importance of the work the European co-legislators, 
the Commission, Council and Parliament have recently started on a digital legislative framework that helps design what a digital euro could look like. This legal framework is uh, quintessential to enable the euro system to potentially issue a digital euro. It's a necessary condition, without that we cannot do it. The ECB uh, governing council discussions have been uh, intensifying recently as far uh, as we, sorry, uh, as we are fast approaching a key decision point uh, in the fall of this year, namely whether or not to move the digital euro project from its current investigation phase into a more concrete preparation phase. This preparation phase would see the euro system constructing the building blocks it would need uh, to potentially issue a digital euro at some point in the future. It behooves us to briefly look back on the journey we have already covered so far. Several drivers have led us down this road. First, of course, the announcement a few years ago by a big tech company that I'm not going to name, uh, that they would set up their own stable coin called Libra. Uh, secondly, the geopolitical context we live in uh, that leads towards augmenting European autonomy and resilience in key areas, including in payments, and thirdly, the international role of the euro, which we should guard and promote. As central banks around the world are exploring retail CBDCs, it is natural that the euro system should do likewise. We started down this road in October 21, when we started the investigation uh, to, to investigate what the digital euro could and should look like. Four progress reports have been published since then, each setting out the thinking um, the euro system has been doing in this, on this matter. Vitally, last June, the European Commission published, it, published its digital euro legislative proposal. What will you be able to learn today from uh, this conference? I can assure you that the lineup of speakers here today ensures that you will hear from every possible stakeholder viewpoint what their ideas, suggestions, and concerns on a digital, digital euro are. Let me remind you that the euro system is only just about to wrap up its first investigation phase and that discussion between co-legislators have only recently started, so there is still room for the project to be amended uh, uh, and uh, here and there um, uh, change if need be. We should listen carefully and int intensely to all stakeholders to ensure their feedback is taken into account when we consider any design of a digital euro going forward. By the way, the, I think it was yesterday, uh, yesterday there was a, an article in Financial Times that the creation of a digital currency uh, in the euro area or any other part of the world is becoming part of this huge plot together with wokeism, together with the green agenda and so on to control the world and the lives of citizens. So. Uh, it's, it's quite clear that it's, it's, it's not only a purely rational debate and we need to be very uh, paying a lot of attention to that because it's not because it's not rational that it, it doesn't matter. We need to explain, we need to make sure that you know, our people understand that it's not about uh, taking control of their lives, which should be obvious, but apparently uh, some people don't uh, uh, see it as obvious. So the views of speakers representing the payment industries, both banks and acquirers, is of paramount importance uh, of course, and then uh, uh, the views of the, uh, the, the public at large. I am particularly interested as to how they think we should define success to a digital euro, taking into account also the impact uh, a retail CBDC may have on the role of banks in our economy. As we seek this project to be successful, we need to listen equally attentively to consumers and wider society uh, itself. So, uh, the, the place the, the digital euro should take uh, is, is, is a difficult one because we're faced with network economies and it's, it's not so easy to say we want to be there uh, because there is a risk that we are going to be pushed uh, to uh, one of the extreme of the spectrum because of network economies. So this, this is a, an important and complex issue. And I cannot guarantee you that all questions you may have on digital euro will be answered today, though no, I'm not going to make that claim. But I can guarantee you, however, that this conference provides you with a golden opportunity to raise uh, those uh, questions. 
I would therefore warmly encourage you uh, to uh, take advantage from the occasion and ask your questions to our different speakers today and maybe later if you uh, want to talk to them um, and, and ask them for uh, meetings later on. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to have uh, here policy makers both from central banks and the European Commission around the table today as well as stakeholders from the industry and consumer rights organizations. I think there are a uh, few uh, audiences uh, imaginable that would be better positioned at this stage to answer uh, your questions. Digital euro will not be in our pockets, or should, it, should I say probably smart, uh, smartphone tomorrow. It's going to take some time. We are uh, more or less still at the beginning uh, of a journey that could change what our currency looks like. Uh, and I again invite you all uh, to join us on this journey today as we discuss its impact consider its merits and its advantages and look uh, towards the future. I wish you a very uh, fruitful discussion today and I would now like to hand over to my colleague Robert Holtzman, Governor, Governor of the Austrian uh, Central Bank. Thank you. Merci Pierre. Bonjour, Morgen. Good morning. Uh, it's a great pleasure being here and having and opening this uh, joint event. Uh, Mr. Wunsch, Governor Wunsch, has already mentioned that there have been a number of discussions where this important topic has been raised. Or my sense is yes, uh, but there have not been yet enough or which brings together the sometimes quite opposing visions about or what uh, the digital euro can do in particular the industry, the public sector, and uh, uh, the banking system there. So I'm very happy that uh, uh, Governor Wunsch and the uh, Belgium National Bank was able to bring together this impressive crowd of people, and I'm looking forward to a great uh, discussion. Governor Wunsch has already made all these points uh, uh, which have to be made about the process, what the expectations are. I would like to I just say, impose on you the three things which I think are important uh, for the way forward. And it starts out uh, with uh, uh, my understanding that uh, what we are still missing is a convincing storyline for the digital euro. Something which we can put in front of people, like he mentioned yesterday, sir, Financial Times article. Uh, that uh, uh, the digital euro is only there to suppress uh, people, to control and other things there. And uh, uh, But we also have uh, not always a convincing storyline uh, with regards to some of our uh, say otherwise close interlocutors, which is the banking system. So I recall I had, uh, I meet the banking sector, the CEOs uh, every uh, quarter of a year for a lunch, and I have to say we had heated discussions, and it took some time in order to open them to bring them along. Uh, and it's even worse if one talks to some people who say, okay, I use my smartphone, so what is in addition to that? So the convincing storyline is uh, emerging, but still not there in, in order to have it as a kind of a quick response there. And in my view, it needs to start out in the way that uh, money is perhaps one of the oldest public goods. So money is an important part, how to say, of a functioning system. So the storyline has to, at the beginning, to stress the public goods character, but this in a kind of international context. Because what it means is that there uh, many countries are experiment in thinking about their, um, the uh, digital version of their money there. And the question is, sir, let's assume that uh, one country is very good and comes forward with uh, money which is very easily usable, can be handed down on our smartphones immediately, we can use it everywhere, and it has the character of uh, a public money there how would we have to react to it? Well, the thing is, for me, the consequence is that uh, 
perhaps we don't have to be the first one, but we have to be ready for that. And uh, the public character of, uh, of money and also of digital money matters there. And uh, so in order to keep our monetary independence within Europe, we need to have a very good and a very strong, the well thought through digital currency, because otherwise we may be, uh, we risk uh, to have something which has been known in other countries by dollarization, that uh, the, the dominant money crowds out the other money. So the storyline is that public, uh, that uh, uh, digital currency has a public good character. It's important there, and it is something which is required uh, for us to keep independence and to keep her. Uh, to keep the, uh, uh, the monetary sovereignty uh, within the euro. This is for me a very important point uh, to think through and I'm looking forward to hear some of the reactions there. The second one is, uh, which is typically stressed, is uh, oh, with the digital euro you finally can overcome our, uh, what was it, market failure at European level to bring the banks together to, uh, together to create a European payment initiative, European payment system. Yes, uh, this is very important and uh, I think uh, 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 the digital euro can be finally the uh, instrument in order to gather behind it uh, the European uh, interests. Sir. And I think that's an important part to keep, uh, as we all know, foreign uh, providers in clearing and others outer, because this could, in a different uh, geopolitical situation, a major part, it could hamper our payment possibilities. So the euro as a basis for a payment system, so the rails on which are different, uh, different functions can work, I think that's for me a second important part. And uh, a, last part of it uh, is that, of course, that uh, digital euro as a new form, as an electronic form of money, also offers uh, uh, social inclusion. It is something which uh, uh, people at the fringes of society needs also be able to use uh, because uh, also because cash becomes less important. We'll come back to that. So this is the first part of it to think it. A second part I would like to encourage you is to think about uh, uh, again uh, through some things which have perhaps been decided uh, already in the high level task force, but which still, how to say, may require some additional discussions in order how to do it. Uh, no interest rate has been decided, looks reasonable. Uh, programmability, no, but building on it makes sense of it. Uh, we have the question of the access of the external to the digital euro. So if a tourist comes into it, can he use it and how can he use it? At the moment, this is not very well defined yet in the technical way that's proposed. I think that sounds important. But also for us, if we go outside, how can we use the digital euros uh, in the outside, account token, etc., etc. Uh, and uh, uh, the question is, and I think uh, uh, which uh, is, requires improvement in the current legislative proposal by the European Commission, is to put uh, the digital euro as well as casher at equal level. At the moment, the digital euro, how to say, is well uh, protected because uh, the way that it's formulated makes sure, how to say, that it has to be accepted uh, by, by commerce. It's not the same strength it has for, uh, for cash. And I think uh, it's important, and uh, what the Austrian government, uh, uh, Mr. Finance, will put forward as a kind of reaction, also will take it up. Cash needs to be accepted as strongly as the digital euro. So the no cash sign as such uh, should not be the norm, but the pretty exception. The reason why it is so important is that uh, 
if uh, the uh, notion gets through that cash is less protected, this would give a lot of uh, support for those who believe the, there's a, an agenda behind the digital euro, which is not uh, the case. And last but not least, as a kind of th food for thought, we have a proposal now. The uh, high-level task uh, force worked well. The question is, is this the best what we can do or what the uh, group has been doing? And uh, I mentioned that, that uh, over recent months or ever since came the, into discussion, we were looking into what other countries are doing. And in uh, July of this year, I had the pleasure of leading a small team of uh, Austin National Banker to China. And we had uh, meetings there with the group uh, developing uh, the, uh, uh, the digital yuan. And uh, we got, uh, I would say, more information uh, what they, how they want to put the different features of the digital yuan into operation. And there are things there, if the world succeeds to make it happen, would create, how to say, quite some challenges because uh, for them, it's clear that in the future, if you are a tourist, if you come to China, you can easily also use the Chinese one. Of course, you may be afraid uh, that something else is loaded on, but there's a concept which is there. What you also have, you have, for, for example, four different categories of, uh, of, uh, of account owners, from the ones who only need how to save for small bread and butter, for the ones who has uh, a much higher volume in which he can <coughs> keep uh, digital euros, but in this case he has to uh, provide much more information uh, about uh, himself. Uh, uh, then uh, also multiple accounts or also that the business can use uh, the digital euros, etc. I don't know whether all of these features are useful. I don't know all of these features uh, we need to have her. But uh, for me the question is, uh, once we have the digital euro, and it has been settled and reduced it, uh, and then we find out, hmm, actually this kind of feature uh, would have been quite useful and we don't have it and others have it. This may create and comes back to the first part that uh, we may at least at the margin be crowded out by other innovations. So I think, yes, sir, we are close to a decision uh, uh, on it, uh, but I hope, how to say, the discussion here will show that there may be other features we may to take into account or current features to be discussed. Uh, and so I'm looking forward, an impressive crowd here, and I'm looking forward to a great discussion in which we bring forward something which is monumental and which is, a, say, how to say, a century affair. We won't come back to such a decision as soon again. It's as strong as we had uh, over 100 years ago when banknotes in the current form where we have introduced and so I wish us a very productive discussion. Thank you very much. Vielen Dank, uh, Herr Holzmann. Thank you very much, Governor Wunsch, uh, for setting the scene for the rest of the conference of this morning. Our next speaker is Mrs. Evelyn Wittox. Evelyn has extensive professional experience in the European payments industry before she joined the ECB. And today she plays in the tower in Frankfurt a key role in the CBDC project as she is the ECB's digital euro program director. So the right woman on the right place today here with us in Brussels. Evelyn will share with us the latest insights from Frankfurt and the euro system on the digital euro in her presentation titled The Digital Euro Central Bank Money in the Digital Age. We are in the digital age as well. As we know, if you want to tweet about, or to X, have to say to X, to tweet about the conference today, you can do so. We have a hashtag uh, on the right-hand side uh, uh, of the presentation. You can find it there. We welcome your tweets. If they are nice, we will retweet them. If they are constructive, we will retweet them as well. So next speaker is Mrs. Evelyn Wittox.
Good morning. Uh, after such uh, uh, good introductions, I would say, to the topic, um, I will have probably some overlap, uh, and I think it's good, because uh, in the Euro system we work uh, uh, together on the digital Euro. So what I want to do today, uh, after I have thanked you for, uh, for having me here and for coming over to listen uh, to the digital Euro and to discuss the digital Euro, uh, I would like to give you an update on where we are in the program. Um, as mentioned before, uh, just before the summer with the draft legislation be published has been a really important uh, milestone for the project. We didn't do it ourselves, the Commission did this of course, uh, but it's very important uh, uh, for, for the digital euro uh, and its design going forward. So what I want to do, I take you a bit uh, through uh, the digital euro, what it is, why we would need it, but also uh, in more depth uh, in, the, in the design. So I have to touch on. So very basic, what actually is a digital euro? So a digital euro is central bank money for retail payments. So we also have discussions on uh, CBDC for wholesale, but the, the digital euro talks about a retail uh, a solution uh, for retail payments available for both citizens and businesses in the entire uh, euro area. So we have today, and it was mentioned a, a lot of time, and it's an important part of the discussion about cash, which is a central bank money, uh, and we believe that in, in moving forward to a digital age, it's important that there's also central bank money available uh, in a digital form. And with that, I already come to one of the reasons why uh, the ECB uh, and the euro system would issue a digital euro. And first is the evolution of money. I will come back to all three of them in a bit more detail in the next slides. But we all know that cash is used less and less. It differs uh, over uh, the euro area. Uh, but in some countries, I come from the Netherlands, it's only one in five of the transactions that is still done in cash. Um, and uh, we also see that more and more, because we live in a digital world, we cannot even pay with cash because we are online uh, and it's impossible to pay with uh, cash. We also believe that the digital euro would make our life easier. Uh, it is designed as a, a payment solution which would have European reach. And uh, what was mentioned before, uh, both the, uh, uh, the foreseen legal tender in the legislation with both mandatory distribution and mandatory acceptance would make sure that uh, uh, you can use it everywhere in the euro area. And last but not least, and it was alluded to before, um, uh, the increased resilience. Um, we sometimes talk with people like, why would we need it? Everything is fine now. But we need to look to the, to the future. Uh, and we, the future is not, that's one thing we know for sure, that will not be exactly as it is today. Uh, we will see uh, uh, new participants in, uh, uh, in the market uh, being uh, also non-European uh, big uh, providers uh, becoming more and more dominant. Um, we will also have, uh, as was alluded before, other countries that might consider digital currencies. So for that, uh, uh, we would consider a digital euro. Let me deep dive a bit more on all three of them. So cash and digital euro, we believe they are stronger together. We say it in every presentation, in everything we write, the digital euro will be an addition to the payment options that are there. So it's there next to cash, it's not uh, taking away cash. And on the other side, it's also there next to private money solutions. It's just, between brackets, uh, uh, offering an, an, an extra option uh, for, to pay. Um, so, and uh, we think that is uh, important, sorry, uh, for a couple of reasons. So we already ma uh, mentioned some of the things, but also uh, as a public good, it would preserve one of the valued ca characteristics of cash and uh, privacy is one of them, and we'll come back to that later on uh, how that is incorporated in the design of the digital euro. And of course, just to be very clear, uh, we share the same currency and a, a euro is a euro when we pay digitally, so that would also be uh, guaranteed. Always an option for, for the payer. So, um, we believe uh, with the current design of the digital euro, it's really uh, uh, 
really providing a new alternative with very distinct value and especially the reach across Europe so that you can trust that wherever you go, independent from which bank you bank, uh, independent from which country you live, independent to which country you travel, uh, you can pay with a digital euro. You can pay digitally peer-to-peer. -peer. So um, I'm working now in Frankfurt. I have a lot of international colleagues. If we go out for drinks, it's impossible to share the bill because we all have different means of payments. We can do it with cash, uh, but digitally it's impossible. Um, and um, going to Frankfurt, um, I, quite often I've moved into a restaurant and I wanted to pay with my card and then cards were accepted but not my card. So these kind of things we will be able to uh, resolve with the digital euro. What's also important uh, and which was recognized in the draft legislation for which we are very uh, uh, happy is that the digital euro will be free for basic use like cash. Uh, and that very much re reflects its public nature as well. And then the last but not least, it's reliable man money no matter what. Um, we believe uh, that everyday payments are an essential service for people and the well-functioning of the economy. Just a, a, a small example, uh, only half a year ago there was a disturbance in payments at IKEA in somewhere in the Netherlands and that ended up in a big traffic jam, uh, the, the police had to come because everybody ran out of the IKEA uh, because they couldn't pay and then they thought, okay, I just go and then the whole system was stopped. It's, it's, it was only the IKEA. I mean, uh, payments, the moment payments don't flow, if only for five minutes, uh, uh, it really uh, disrupts. Uh, so let's imagine if this would take for a longer time. So we need to make sure that always, also in the future, Payments are there, people have easy access to a safe way uh, uh, to pay. Therefore, financial inclusion, financial digital inclusion is also very important in our design so that we ensure that nobody is left behind and that the right to privacy in payments is maintained. And then last but not least, and I alluded to that uh, uh, before, Currently in Europe, we are very dependent on uh, uh, external providers for our digital payments. More than 70% of our payments are going through non-European infrastructure. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, in short, in the design, uh, there are a couple of value edits that are built into the design. One is offline payments. And why is that important? Um, it's important for two reasons. First, a uh, very obvious one, I would say, for resilience. So uh, we still have places in Europe where, it's in pos where there's no internet connection or no good internet connection, like traveling into the mountains in Austria. I forgot to bring cash. My husband did bring it, so fortunately we could bring a beer when we walked from, uh, from one cabin to the other. Uh, but otherwise we would have been without food. Um, so that's one but also the offline design of the digital euro would allow a very high level of privacy. And why is that? Because with an offline pa uh, um, payment, either with two cards or uh, two phones together, people exchange the money like you would exchange a, 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 a payment note. Um, so there is nobody in between, there's no processor in between, so the transactions that you do between uh, yourself have a very high level of privacy, very close to the privacy that cash can uh, provide. We have foreseen, and that's also recognized in the draft legislation, which, uh, for which we are very grateful, is that the digital euro being a public good would really strive for more digital and financial inclusion. It would allow easier and faster online payments, on the privacy, uh, I just explained, for example, the pol uh, possibilities of the offline uh, digital euro uh, that they provide. But also what we have ensured is that uh, in the design of the digital euro and the part of the system that would be in the, uh, provided by the euro system, we would not have uh, the possibility to link any of the data to a, to a, a specific individual. So even if we would want uh, uh, we could not see uh, uh, who is doing these kind of payments. Also, 
uh, if you look to the current payment landscape, uh, we have, and that's by nature with payments being a network product, uh, we have quite some dominant players, uh, which leaves, uh, uh, well, we don't have a monopoly, but a duopoly or triopoly, I, I think it's close. So having ensure uh, uh, an alternative will allow a competitive uh, market. And last but not least, but I alluded to that uh, as well, if you travel in the euro area, you can trust that you can pay uh, wherever you want. Either you do it physically, travel, or uh, online. So how would people use the digital euro? And I've given uh, some examples as well. Well, But we should foresee two form factors, as we call them. So we believe that people could pay either uh, with an app on their uh, mobile phone or with a card. And the app on the mobile phone will be either provided by uh, the euro system or by the distributing uh, uh, PSPs, banks, and uh, also other payment service providers. Both the card and the, uh, the, the uh, um, sorry, mobile solution would be available for online and for offline transactions and where you can pay uh, uh, differs a bit, so with your mobile phone you can pay both physical stores, person to person and e-commerce, and with a card, because of its physical nature, it would of course be uh, available for uh, physical stores and person to person payments. So, if you look to the digital euro being an accessible public good, um, a couple of key features that we have incorporated in the design. So we have foreseen a division of tasks where the euro system will issue the digital euro, uh, like we issue uh, all the euros that are currently around, and we would allow, uh, settle the payments between payers. But we foresee a big role for what we call supervised intermediaries, and which have been defined now also in the draft legislation as payment service providers as defined under the PSD2. Uh, and they will distribute the, manage, uh, the digital euro and they will manage the customer relationship. So uh, citizens of Europe will not have a bank account with the ECB, open it at the ECB, uh, but they will, like they do today, go to their uh, supervised intermediary and will get access to a digital euro account and will be able uh, via them to initiate payments and to receive payments. We have designed it in a way that it's easy to use a digital euro. And that starts, of course, with the onboarding and the simple access. Uh, so, um, as I said before, we foresee two, two forms, either uh, via your existing online banking or mobile banking app that you have with your supervised intermediaries, but there's also uh, the possibility to do this via a new digital euro app that would be launched. And then last but not least, we also believe that uh, it should be very easy to take your digital euros from one provider to the other. So the easy porting of your digital euro holdings from one provider to the other uh, is catered for in, uh, in the design, in including also an emergency porting. Because what if there's a cyber attack, your bank is not available, you should get access to your digital euros. This I uh, alluded to a bit already, so the digital euro would be available online and offline. Uh, so with online, all use cases would be covered, uh, both remote and proximity payments. Uh, and if you look to the privacy there, it will be in line with the current existing digital payments. Without, and that is true for both solutions in online and offline, the euro system seeing any private information that could lead us back to a, uh, a transaction to a person individually. Uh, and then on the offline, as I have explained, uh, it is there for proximity payments between uh, two people paying to each other or uh, in a store. And as I have explained before, it would provide the highest privacy level possible for digital means of payments. Financial digital inclusion is very important uh, and it's not, it's not uh, um, to be neglected that we included explicitly digitally inclusion. So we have still people that are financially excluded, but maybe digital exclusion is even a bigger problem. And we will design the digital euro to make sure that we also onboard people that have no access to the bank account, uh, that has disabilities, uh, but also with low digital and financial skills. 
and some things that we have in mind uh, would be uh, to offer in-person uh, support, uh, also offering a physical card for the ones that would prefer that over a mobile phone, and to allow funding and defunding via cash. And, and that was already mentioned before, the accessibility to the digital services should be facilitated free of charge. So then let me come to the uh, digital euro legislative proposal. As uh, was said uh, uh, before, we really welcome that there is now draft uh, uh, legislation and that now also uh, the, 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 the public debate on the digital euro, how it should look like, um, uh, can start on the basis of that uh, proposal. And we believe that this proposal, as uh, our board member Fabio Panetta has said, uh, is key to ensure that the digital euro really brings the value to the people and that it takes the appreciated features of cash to the digital age. It's a, it's a comprehensive uh, legislative proposal, uh, but let me highlight a couple of the elements that we think uh, are very important uh, and we're very happy that they are recognized in the legislation. First of all, the legal tender sta status, which we believe is very important to make sure that the digital euro is widely accessible, so it's easy to get access to the digital euro, so you don't have to change your bank uh, just to, to be able to get digital euros. On the other hand, that you can trust if you go to a merchant, either online or offline, that you can pay. A high degree of privacy, as was also recognized in the legislation, while it also addressed the balance against anti-money laundering and uh, terrorist financial risks. Basic uh, services free of charge and incent uh, economic incentives for intermediaries to uh, distribute it, we believe that in the, the proposal in the legislation has found a, a, a fair balance there. Uh, the recognition of both on and offline functionalities and then last but not least, uh, it recognizes, as we have said uh, rather early already in the design process of the digital euro, that we would foresee holding limits in order to uh, ha maintain a balance between the bank deposits and central bank money. So, uh, as was said before, uh, we're nearing the end of the investigation phase. Uh, so, in early autumn, uh, we will go back to the governing council uh, with the result of the investigation phase, uh, and we will most probably also propose uh, uh, a next step uh, in, uh, in the development of the digital euro. A couple of things I want to uh, take, make clear. So we won't go to the governing council in autumn to ask for a decision to issue a digital euro. That is not on the table, and that decision will only be taken by a governing council if they take it uh, once the digital euro uh, legislation is adopted. So that means that the legislative uh, process will uh, continue, or just started actually, uh, and that the digital euro project will evolve uh, in parallel. Um, and that would mean that we could further prepare, would at cer a certain point would be decided to issue, but it also allows to take uh, still into consideration any uh, decision that would be taken in the context of uh, the legislative process. So here I would like to conclude. Um, so. Uh, the three things that I hope that you have taken from the, from the, from the speech is that uh, the digital euro will bring the, the benefits of digital uh, payments, but capturing some of the valued uh, properties of cash. It's accepted and will be accepted everywhere by everyone in Europe, and it's reliable money no matter what, because we are in the current state, but nobody knows where we are in 10 or 20 years from now. With that, I would like to end, uh, and as Governor uh, Pierre Wunsch said at the beginning, uh, you can approach me, <laughs> uh, uh, if, uh, and, but then I would think that I would have met a lot of you already, because this whole process we have done, uh, in a, we have tried to do at least in a very open and transparent way, where we have included all stakeholders from the start, uh, so uh, the, the merchants associations, the, the consumer associations, 
um, at the banks and the other financial institutions. And also we have been in a very open and transparent dialogue uh, with uh, both the Commission but also with the European Parliament. And we would stay open to continue this dialogue also in a potential next phase. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and give the floor back. Thank you very much for your comprehensive um, overview uh, about what a potential digital euro can be and what it will be not, yes, because you uh, addressed both um, points of the question. Our next speaker um, is from Vienna, although her name would suggest for the Dutch-speaking people here that she originates from the Netherlands, but no, she's coming from Vienna, Mrs. Niederlander. Uh, and she is Director of Payments, Risk Monitoring and Financial Literacy at the Österreichische Nationalbank since February 2021. Her specific areas of responsibility include ensuring the stability of the Austrian payments infrastructure and fostering new developments as well as ensuring dialogue and cooperation with participating financial institutions. Mrs. Niederlander prepared a presentation for us on the challenges and also the key uh, factors for success for a digital euro. Mrs. Niederlander, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the Central Bank of Belgium to make this uh, event happen and uh, having me here um, to speak about the challenges and key success factors from a perspective of a country, member of the uh, Union and having a euro, but also having quite a big proportion of cash in circulation and also uh, very developed uh, um, digital payments um, infrastructure throughout the country. So we face the question, why we need that thing very often? And uh, let me share with you a little bit of uh, uh, my view and uh, my consideration about that. So majority of the central banks uh, um, do explore digital euro. So they are 90% according to the uh, recent research and more than a half of them plan to implement it or are having real projects on it already. And uh, they are not only small banks uh, or small geographies like Bahamas or some Caribbean countries where one may say what they have to do with us. But we also see um, central banks around the globe such as uh, Royal Bank of England. We see also uh, Bank of Canada issued some uh, research, uh, uh, Bank of, uh, Central Bank of Australia and others, quite uh, significant uh, geographies already talking intensively about why or whether we need the digital currencies and why for. And if you read uh, the materials uh, and deliberations here, and I have to say we are central bankers, we're not the marketing experts, so most probably those uh, uh, messages are not that appealing that of some private companies, but if you deep dive into that, um, I found uh, really three, uh, three messages or three statements repeating ever and ever again, and I can identify them very much for Europe as well. So digital payments are for everybody, anytime and anywhere, as Evelyn said, that actually the core of the digital euro. That means we need to enhance the resilience of the payment system uh, over the time, make it available and performing as we used to have it. Uh, in the next uh, eight so centuries, actually, and secure access to all citizens no matter when and where. Promoting innovation is another very important uh, point. And here, um, I guess we have to put a little bit more of uh, debate and discussion why. So um, if I have to quote, uh, uh, so to say, the successful of uh, the European, success of the European project, we had, by the mid of 90s, uh, almost in every industry, uh, industry champions, and Europe have been very, very successful over time. Yet in the recent years, uh, we tend to give up on our leadership, and if you see in some industries, or a few of the industries, we will not have any more European champions there. 
And one may say, well, but that's how it works. We need more um, data, i.e. deep tech technology, and so what has to do with digital euro? Well, um, we observed, uh, if you go into the numbers, you would see that uh, uh, innovation happens on the backbone of standardization and infrastructure. And we lost uh, quite some bigger infrastructures, uh, basically to other continents, particularly uh, if you see on payments or card fees, we pay uh, 30, more than 30 billion uh, to card schemes. And public standards are the basis for interoperability. We have a great success story with the SEPAM, and I believe that through smart payments, innovation can be feasible also in the area of uh, consumer payments and uh, um, so to say back-to-back -back, uh, uh, contracts as such. And the third uh, argument for CBDC is uh, often the secure and data protected payments. Yes, we do have a very good standards for data protection in Europe, um, but uh, we don't have that much of a choice because in a uh, current uh, digitalized world, where we see more and more of our um, commerce or uh, citizens to business interactions going through digital processes such as car sharing, such as uh, digitally offering uh, or digital order of uh, goods and services and so on, um, you have uh, just a concrete choice, but not extremely wide. Maybe on the user um, interface that seems to be very wide, but if you go down deep to the rails, there have been not so many um, differences and we believe that the um, monetary system as we have it is a balance between public and private money worked well so far. So there should be this kind of a choice for the future. So um, if, I have to, if I can quote the uh, BIS Innovation Hub, they said the success factor uh, for adoption of retail CBDC in particular is the intersection between desirability, feasibility, and viability. That means we need to create success, uh, uh, sorry, we need to cre create incentives for citizens, for the financial sectors uh, as such, in order that we see um, CBDCs or digital euro uh, being adopted broadly uh, into the countries we are aiming at, and also into countries uh, uh, such as Austria, which have uh, widely developed uh, uh, services, financial services, and uh, cash circulation. And if I can uh, refer to the three of them, I believe that desirability or incentives for the citizens are at the one hand the legal tender, the broad acceptance, but also the cost-free services uh, in order that citizens can use uh, CBDC or digital euro exactly like they use cash today. On the other hand side, we have uh, the incentives for the financial sectors, and we have not to forget that, because uh, those are the um, guys who implement it. Those are the partners uh, and uh, the infrastructure which brings that product basically to the customer. And here I believe that the uh, uh, form factor which uh, is aligned and uh, which is uh, serving both public and private money can be of help as well as a clear compensation model that ensures PSPs have uh, uh, enough uh, business case to cover their costs. And last but not least, um, what is important for central banks, and we work or together on the um, ECB project very strongly around that, is the concerns around privacy, uh, legal and regulatory aspects, and uh, education of the public. Privacy is uh, a key USP of uh, cash or public money today, and I believe that should be in the future the key USP for the digital money. Because in a, a commercial world where you have to balance the demand and supply, there is no reason why you should uh, give an asset for free without asking the customer whether he or she wants to do so. So we do need a level playing field, and I firmly believe that this can be created through the digital euro. ECB had done a focus group study together with uh, um, more than 300 users, obviously not uh, in uh, significance, so we can say we have reviewed all the 
geographies and all uh, of the uh, demographies we have in Europe. But yet, still, we can see that younger people are more likely to try new technologies. So we definitely need to think about the demand of the younger population when talking about uh, uh, success factors of implementation. Um, it's not even about us here in the room, but about the new uh, users to come. And the digital wallets depends on how it will be introduced per uh, overseen intermediaries, and banks can play a good role in that. Underbanked people in particular feel uncomfortable with the idea of adopting new digital payment solution. So exactly, uh, central banks have to take that very seriously and think about uh, how to embed uh, uh, digital inclusion and uh, uh, take their demand on board. In the Austrian Central Bank, we have uh, um, spent the last six months also going to the um, users and trying to identify uh, how they may use a digital euro potentially in 2027. And here our intention was not so much to achieve a broader demographic focus uh, group uh, um, uh, review, but rather to see how particular lead users or particular technically affin and young people who today are ahead of the curve of adoption of digital technology, how they see CBDCs and what kind of needs they may have here. We have uh, contacted uh, 115 users and 48 experts to identify trends and did more than 65 interviews with them. There are few, uh, four key challenges for adoption which came out of that. Um, the one was data and privacy concerns. So basically, uh, users, even younger ones, and those who are technically a fiend, although we say everybody gives his data to Facebook, uh, why data should make a difference, all of them quoted that data protection and a, a more data secure private mean of payment in digital space can make a huge difference, and that's not existing today. Universal transmission in terms that digital currency or digital euro should be universally embedded in everyday's life was one of the other observations which fits very well to the notion of legal tender, to the legal regulation we have uh, see proposal and to the work we have done and a deeper integration into the daily life habits, as I mentioned before. Few of the wallet function came of that research as well. One of them strongly uh, supporting the offline functionality and showing that even for technically fiend people who may continuously be online and uh, uh, de demand or consume digital services, even those they say offline functionality brings value because it ensures you're not going out of uh, your uh, mean of payment, you have continuity and you don't have user experience breaks here. Just a few words about the uh, three of them, just to show you the bunch of factors we have identified. So besides of the three, we have uh, further 12 factors which have been mentioned and uh, there was a clear prevalence of the pri privacy and transmission points. Um, what does, uh, um, or, uh, there is a big debate about should it be anonymous and private and uh, is that means that we are supporting uh, um, not orderly done uh, business as such and how digital currencies may be misused for the sake of uh, uh, money laundering and not paying taxes and all that things. So um, if we put that debate for a while aside and look at the perspective uh, that uh, there is an unmet need for privacy in the population and that there is currently basically no choice and for that reason there is no competition, no pricing, no um, uh, other opportunity to pay besides of giving your data further to the payment recipient. Um, anonym anonymous or private transactions means nothing else than that the sender of the money has the right to decide whether the receiver gets his personal data or not. That is uh, not uh, in contradiction um, to law and uh, I believe there should be a clear understanding and clear work to explain that uh, 
digital currencies fulfill all norms and have to fulfill all norms and will be doing so, but still pricing of data should not be led to network effects, uh, duopolies or other market structures. Pricing of data is something which will play a big role in our uh, economies in the future and that's a basis for future infrastructure for financial services uh, as such. Um, there is also a supply side issues which we need to solve or see and I can tell you a story about an Austrian um, company called Quick which started very early back in 1996 uh, implementing digital cash. So uh, we had already uh, this idea. They've been um, basically decommissioned later in 2017 because of not uh, reaching successfully their uh, objective. It's a matter of timing as well. Back then, uh, Quick was a private company, or it was launched by a private company, uh, which was a card acquirer. They uh, had the aim to uh, deliver micropayments, five to 400 euro basically, but more on the side of five. They've been um, broadly distributed and used the um, close uh, uh, utilization of POS terminals and other machines which accepted other card payments and had actually quite successful start, reached uh, um, 20,000 users and more than 200 cards been issued as such. For Austria that's not a small number <laughs> I have to say. But at the end of the day, they uh, counted for less than half percent of the uh, Austrian uh, debit card payments as such. So 2019 being um, decommissioned. What we see from this example is uh, that it's not only about acceptance. Quick had that acceptance perfectly well. But in a world of increasing uh, demand of uh, power, so to say, where the user experience is a king and where you need users to adopt that payments quickly. We saw quick um, example uh, lacking of, uh, uh, of usability. There was uh, a biggest issue of the people having uh, visibility in their balances. That was not that easy to load the prepaid card because you have to go to special terminals and do so. And of course, it was an issue to get your money out of there. So these kind of, uh, um, uh, of uh, non-fragmented process on the user side is essential for adoption. People need to feel that they are in control. They have to be in control and there should be a um, form factor or entry point which allows for that. So if I have to uh, conclude out of our more than 20 years example or experience in Quick in Austria, um, I believe that uh, form factor and cost for access are major drivers on the supply side and coordination costs, that means the scheme and how you do so is another one. And uh, let me come to the end uh, and conclude on my presentation. Uh, success factors for the adoption of the digital euro um, are alignment of public objectives meet with future expectations of citizens and private sector initiatives. So on the one side, we need to design and pilot effective market uh, incentives. That means we need to think about how the financial intermediaries will uh, implement the digital euro as a product, how it will end up at the end of the day uh, at the wallets of the users and make incentives that that works well. Um, but we also need uh, to communicate and engage with all stakeholders, educate citizens and uh, allow for uh, experimentation phase in a technical way. So that uh, um, uh, those kind of integrations prove in praxis to be uh, viable and uh, acceptable, understandable for the general public. With that, I would like to thank you very much for listening to me and give back to the... Uh... Thank you, Frau Niederlander. I hope, ladies and gentlemen, that we have served you some food for thought, but also for some questions. Um, the next uh, 15 to 20 minutes, our speakers will answer some questions you might have. 
please raise your hands and um, someone with a microphone will approach you. I kindly ask you as well to um, introduce yourself, um, if your name, function or who you're representing. And I ask you because we have a question and answer session of about 20, 15, 20 minutes, please um, make your questions quite brief so we have more time to answer questions. I ask uh, Evelyn and uh, Frau Niedlander to come to the stage and so we can start. Okay, that's, that's always a good sign that there is already a question before I start. Thank you very much. Um, the lady here on the third row, left. Thank you very much for these very interesting presentations. Anna Martin from BEUG, the European Consumer Organization. Uh, I would have a question for the online um, version of the Digital Euro. We had this very interesting presentation of um, Mr. Mrs. Niederländer on the fact that uh, privacy is a key factor and that will be even a unique selling point. So my question uh, is, um, shouldn't we then have not more privacy also for the online version, more than the comparable digital payment methods than what was explained by, by you, Evelyn? So, uh, question to the both. <laughs> um, yes, so, so it, it's uh, maybe a question not to direct uh, to, to the ECB. Uh, so what we, what of course needs to be balanced in, in the design of, of payment solutions is on one hand the, the right to privacy and the other hand that we want to fight uh, fraud, uh, anti-money laundering, uh, money laundering, not we want. Um, so uh, in that, in the draft legislation, you see that, there, that they have found a, a, a balance uh, on that. Um, and that would mean uh, that there is visibility within the intermediaries uh, to do their task like they do for also other payment solutions at the moment. I, I want to stress that it, that it means that the euro system will not see anything. Uh, so we will not be able to see anything to, uh, and to be able to uh, link this to a private individual, just to be uh, completely clear on that. Um, but I, I think it's more a discussion in, in the legislative debate going forward. Okay, thank you. Um, we stay in the same uh, area. There is a question also on the fourth row on the corner. Yes. The yes. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I'm, I'm Gilles Coutsig uh, from the Cabinet of the Ministry of Finance. Um, I, I have two personal questions. Uh, I will... I will slip them in briefly. Um, the first one is the deposit warranty uh, scheme, which is still unaddressed or has been unaddressed in uh, four of your um, presentations. Um, but doesn't that already cover uh, a lot of the responses that, uh, that the digital euro uh, tries to address, uh, questions that, that they try to address? Um, and secondly, um, the, the inclusion, um, in, uh, to my understanding, the inclusion um, is not addressed with the digital euro because the, um, the, the PSPs are, uh, stay the, the intermediary and, and aren't the, um, the, the, the questions or the burdens um, for um, entering the digital euro as a consumer. Um, aren't they the same as opening a bank account? Interesting. May I start with, this? May I start with the um, inclusion, maybe? Yeah? Uh, there, is, uh, there are different forms of inclusion. Of course, there are people... Well, there is inclusion... Oh, sorry, yeah, that's worse. Yes. Uh, there are different forms of inclusion. There are, of course, a lot of types which cannot be resolved with a, a digital currency if we talk about people who does not uh, do well uh, with uh, digital uh, means, etc., etc. But if you think about, we had a recently uh, a project or a, a small exercise with a group of students called uh, Digitales Kleingeld, which would say something like the digital um, small pocket money or small money. And we have uh, uh, people who are depending on uh, cash uh, donations. We have uh, people and organizations who take, take care about them. Current development is that uh, few and fewer people carry cash with them, so those people suffer. And if you think about these kind of examples, 
where a uh, cost of transacting money should be carried by somebody and the uh, NGOs are not, not set up doing so. Uh, there for sure is a barrier for an entry, uh, how to service those people and how to develop models to service them. Um, another example uh, will be people in care. They are a huge need of having uh, transparent, reliable and so on mean of payment where they can transact digitally because today we have a lot of people in care because of the uh, demographic changes and people just will give their bank card to the others or do something else which is also not very secure so we do have areas in the society to look at we should just do that and uh, design a proper functions uh, which cover them but obviously we will not solve all the problems just with that Maybe, maybe then take uh, uh, your first question. Uh, so, of course, the, the deposit warranty uh, gives security to, uh, to people. Uh, that's undoubtedly true. But wouldn't it be strange that if you envisioned a, a future where that we pay much more digitally than we do today, I'm back now, yes, sorry. Um, but wouldn't it be strange that if, uh, if you, let me take a bit further, if you want to do payments, the only way to do payments is that you give your money to a financial institution and then it's your, your, the, that's the only way that you can do payments. So wouldn't it be good that there's an alternative? If you want to do that, it's fine. But wouldn't it be good that there's an alternative that you keep the ownership of your money and that you can also do payments with this money. I think that's, that's essential, and I think it's essential that that option remains there uh, towards the future. Okay, thank you. Um, there was a question in the row behind uh, Hans, and then we will move to the other block. Uh, yeah, uh, yes. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Jack Schickler from Coindesk. Um, some of the concerns, as were referred to earlier, about the digital euro aren't about technical features, but are about issues of the culture war, social control, um, kind of the, the wokeism debate, as, as Mr. Wunsch referred to it as. Um, is it a worry for you that that could stop the Digital Euro project from happening, um, those kind of concerns? And what can you as, as central banks do about it? Um. Yes, of course we are uh, concerned because uh, these are people of our society um, that uh, we would like to take their concerns away. The problem is how can we do that? Because on the topics that have been raised, that's about the concern on privacy, we have been very adamant uh, from the start that we would design the system, uh, the Euro system, in a way that we cannot track data uh, to a pri private individual. We have also been extremely clear from the start, even before the investigation phase, that the digital euro would not be programmable. We would not, uh, and then programmable money. Uh, let me be more precise. Uh, we have been very clear that the euro is a euro. So we will not uh, put any limits because otherwise it would be like a voucher and we are not in the business of issuing vouchers. So we have been very clear, uh, we, we understand these concerns and we have taken them explicitly in the design. The next step is how can we convince the people that we are telling the truth actually. I think that that's uh, 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 the point. But yes, of course it's a concern and that's also why we need to have a, a continuous dialogue uh, and, uh, and I hope that we can, are able to convince the people that the statements we make are uh, uh, also uh, the truth. Yeah. We have also decided to step up our communication efforts. You will see that over the next months. Central banks are discussing how we are going to do that. This conference is just an example of how we try to explain in a transparent way what we are doing. And I think that by explaining we will go in the right direction as well. Okay, some questions from the main block. Yes, uh, sir. Uh, Hans, the, the fourth row in the middle block. 
Thank you, uh, Diederik Brugging, ESWD, European Savings and Vital Bank Group. Uh, first of all, I, did, I noted uh, the communication is changing because the narrative on Evelyn's uh, slides changed uh, significantly. Congratulations on that. And also, um, there aren't any bookmakers in the room, but I think it's very likely that the uh, Covenant Council will decide to move on to the next phase uh, in, uh, in, in autumn, which is also great. But I was wondering, uh, you mentioned already a lot of uh, market engagement is taking place in the current phase. Uh, some of that is uh, stopping uh, ahead of the decision. But how are you going to engage with the market in the next phase, uh, Evelyn? More question for you than to uh, Petia, but uh, if Petia wants to chip in also free. But thank you. Well, let me say something uh, what we do uh, uh, on, on the European level, and then maybe Petia can say something what the National Bank is doing as an example, because each National Bank is, is uh, taking uh, uh, quite some efforts uh, on the discussions. No, we foresee to continue uh, the dialogue that we have. We have the Rulebook Development Group, um, where, which consists uh, of the four major stakeholders, uh, so the merchants, the, um, the consumers, and the, the financial institutions, both the banks and the non-banks. Uh, so that will continue, that will not be disrupted, uh, that work will also continue uh, um, uh, going forward, assuming, of course, that it, the project is not stopped uh, in October. Um, and then uh, going forward, we would uh, continue to uh, at least uh, continue the discussion with the ERPB, the European Retail Payments Board, that will cons uh, stay there. But um, as said before, we will uh, further um, continue on communication, on doing uh, research on user experience, doing uh, uh, some testing. So it, it will be a wider palette than uh, and only that. But uh, I, I can just stress that the communication and being in a dialogue with every, all stakeholders, and I mentioned the market stakeholders, but that's also true, of course, for uh, the wider society will remain an important element of a uh, uh, next phase as well. And maybe, Petya, you want to say something on the... Um, I, I, I think that's... Uh, so, hi, hey, no, I'll be changed here. I, I think the... Um, the dialogue is very important and we have to engage with the multi-stakeholder group here. That's a very important thing because we often talk about multi-stakeholder group and then we have two or three big lobbies sitting there and debating the points that are important for them. I fully understand that that's important for the job, but we have to engage with the whole society. So what we do have is we have, of course, uh, since uh, closely following the project since the beginning of this phase, uh, regular um, meeting with the banks in Austria and financial institutions to inform them about the progress and debate uh, certain points of implementation form factor in particular, which is extremely important to ensure smooth user experience. But what we start as well is together with our innovation hub to engage more with the broader uh, public. We have, uh, uh, we talk to students, we have uh, experiments, we want to see also, or to give also the population, the citizenship, the possibility to have a look and feel, because those conspiracy theories, they uh, appear out of uh, the uh, uh, feeling not being under control, and we have to have a proper dialogue with the citizenship so that they persuade themselves and give feedback. Thank you. More questions? Um, we stay in the middle block at the very end row. Yes, thank you. Uh, Lawrence Bukart, uh, Trends. Um, there were talks about being a limited amount of digital euros that could be used monthly, uh, on a monthly basis. Um, is that still the case, like 3,000 euros or something? No, no, what we uh, uh, have proposed that there would be holding limits. So that has nothing to do with how much you spend, but how much you can hold that would not be determined on a monthly basis, that would be just the maximum that you could hold. Um, setting this holding limit would only happen much closer to the issue, and so we have not uh, put any number. We have mentioned the number of 3,000 euros, so uh, that you recollect correctly, as, uh, uh, as this number came out as a for, uh, from a first study that we did uh, during the investigation phase, but uh, I just want to make clear that this, this number has not been set yet. Okay. More questions? Yes, uh, sir, on the third row at the corner. Uh, 
Thank you. Uh, as a normal citizen, I still ask myself the question, what can I do differently and better with digital euro that I cannot do for the time being with the normal euro? That, that is a super example of uh, 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 technology, right? We have to change mics in order that it works. The same is also uh, for the current payments uh, digitally. If you go and pay with your bank note, that works uh, frictionless everywhere. You can pay in the mountains in Austria as well as uh, here in Brussels. Maybe if you go to Netherlands, not everywhere, but you can pay uh, frictionless. If you pay digitally, and you have a certain uh, mean of payment, Most, there are situations where you cannot do that. I've been in Greece, I tried to book a ferry boat, it was not possible. I had to change provider three times until I managed it online, I have to say. Today online payments are just 10% of the, uh, at least in Austria, of the total payments, so uh, online initiated payments, I mean. Um, and that's not a big deal because out of those 10, maybe, I don't know, 10% breakthrough, which will be 1% in average, it's not a big deal. But if you think in the future, frictionless digital initiated payments, which carry a lot of data in secure and uh, 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 private way or from your controlled way, that is something which I believe you can do differently. You want to add something, Evelyn? Uh, well, I think uh, Petya was already uh, uh, pretty clear, um, but I, I think it, it's, uh, it's not the only question you should get, so what can I functionally do differently? I think what we also try to explain is, is that it's also about the nature of money, and you, normal citizens uh, don't worry about that, and I think that's a very good thing, that you don't worry about that, you put your money at a financial institution, you trust that you get a perfect payment solutions. Um, and we need to make sure that that, that continues. But that, that part of that trust is built on the fact that if you go to the bank, you can uh, convert it to cash and you can f convert it back. If we go into a world where there is far less cash, uh, or the cash that you get you cannot use everywhere where you want to pay, then this trust might b disappear if there's no central bank money available anymore that, uh, 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 that built this trust on, on this convertibility. So uh, uh, apart from the features, and I think we have not mentioned or you have not mentioned the online, uh, the offline uh, uh, functionality, uh, it's also about, I would say, the, the basic uh, uh, concept of money that's underneath that, which is important. Okay, thank you. We have time for one or two maximum questions. Yes, sir? And then later the lady at the back. Hello, morning. Uh, Gonzalo Cris from uh, Santander. Um, a quick question. Uh, Evelyn, you mentioned that there is two ways to distribute the digital euro, will be through intermediaries and also a new app. I, I imagine that is a wallet. Uh, my question is who will be developing that app, distributing, maintaining? And the second question is if there is any connection with the wallet being proposed by the European Commission related to the digital identity. Thank you. Yeah, so what we foresee is, is two options. So either uh, the bank integrates it in uh, uh, um, their solutions, their, their mobile wallets, or you have access via a digital uh, wallet which will be provided by the euro system. Um, so that is uh, to your first point. Um, sorry, I forgot the second point. Oh yeah, the link, sorry, <coughs> the link to the digital identity. So um, what we currently foreseen, but there's currently still being work in, uh, done in the, um, in the rulebook work, um, which really deals with identification, authentication, how it can be done. But what we actually foresee is, is that the digital euro will be open for multiple ways to identify and authenticate yourself and the European Digital Identity Wallet would be one of the options that would be there if you would want to use that. Okay, that's clear. And we have the last question. Uh, yeah, the lady at the back. Thank you, uh, Pascal Bryan from Fidelis Consulting. Now there is an elephant in the room, which is um, the European sovereignty. We know there are two great initiatives, uh, private initiatives, EPI and EMSA. 
um, it is very difficult from the private sector to understand how a digital euro scheme cannot be a direct competitor to these two great initiatives. Um, and uh, Mr. Panetta, um, this week in Parliament, talked about a way to offer rails to these uh, European initiatives. Could you, could you give more details about this to make sure that um, the digital euro is not a direct competitor to what Europe is expecting, i.e. a purely sovereign European payment initiative. Thank you. Well, first of all, um, we have been, uh, or the ECB, the Eurosystem, be very clear in their retail payment strategy that they are uh, advocating for multiple European uh, payment uh, solution. Uh, so I think that that has not changed. Uh, so as we have said, the digital euro will be just an, another alternative next to the ones that exist or the ones that will come into existence, which we would really welcome. And so we would be next to cash. We will also be next to private solutions and we would welcome if the private solution would be more European based than they are currently um, uh, as a first. Second, and we also believe with the digitalization that there's room enough for everybody. Um, then, uh, last but not least, and that's more on the scheme. So the scheme really works on standardization and it works on uh, the standardization of, I would say, more the back end of a digital euro, but also very much how you can pay uh, um, in, in the front end. So how you can pay between two people or how you can pay in an online or a physical store. Um, and uh, the, these standards uh, will be available and could be reused. So if you make a combination of instant payment rails with these kind of standards, we really believe that that also will help uh, the rollout of European uh, uh, solutions, especially at the point of sale where there currently is a, a high dependency on non-European solutions. Thank you. Uh, time for a well-deserved coffee break of about 20 minutes. So we will gather again at uh, 10 to 11 for a very interesting panel discussion. I'm sure many other questions that you may have in mind will be addressed during the panel discussion. Enjoy. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Time for the second part of our conference. Very interesting part as well because we will have a panel discussion uh, with representatives uh, representing various stakeholders in the ongoing discussion. Uh, the panel debate will be led by a director of the Central Bank of Belgium, Mr. Tim Hermans. Tim Hermans is in the bank responsible uh, for cash, but also for uh, digital payments. Uh, and IT, so um, very interesting portfolio. Um, and he is also, as the governor already said in the beginning, he is the member of the high-level task force of the ECB, um, and so very well placed um, to uh, coordinate and to moderate the second part of today's conference. Tim. Okay, thank you, Geert, and uh, welcome everyone. Um, I think I am the ideal person to guide you through this panel. I will put up my glasses to read my index cards. Um, so I'm also responsible for cash, so I'm, I'm not afraid to show that I also use paper to uh, prepare for these kinds of uh, occasions. So I'm very excited uh, now that after we have heard from uh, central bank representatives um, on the digital euro, what it is, what it's going to be, uh, some kind of some critiques and after your questions that we now have the opportunity to hear from um, well industry and societies uh, representatives um, they will uh, surely have very valuable insights in what they believe uh, are the key success factors of the digital euro and what the pitfall pitfalls uh, might be so I'm very excited in this panel today. I will uh, briefly introduce the panelists. So at my left and your right, uh, we have uh, Monique Hoyens, and she's from the European uh, Consumers Organization. Um, then we have Sylvie from uh, Worldline. Uh, we have Erik Lutz from uh, KBC Bank and Insurances. And then we have uh, Jan Seysens from uh, the Commission. So I'm sure that after I've asked the first question, uh, they can perhaps give some more uh, background of uh, their function and what they're doing and how they uh, look at the uh, project of the digital euro. 
So maybe to start off the first round of questions, I was thinking that I would ask each of my panelists the same question, um, namely what they believe are the uh, key success factors or the, uh, the needed design features of the, key, of the digital euro to be a success. And uh, maybe I'll start with uh, Jan. Um, well, you're one of the responsibles of uh, drafting uh, the proposal of the Commission um, of the Digital Euro. Um, what do you believe are the most important issues or the most important key success factors for the introduction of digital euro and more specifically for an end user uh, perspective? Thank you very much, and thank you very much indeed for inviting me to this uh, distinguished panel and to the uh, conference uh, here. So indeed, as you mentioned, um, the European Commission, we have been uh, proposing before the summer indeed a legislative uh, framework, which is uh, necessary actually to introduce a, a digital euro for the general public uh, uh, indeed, uh, and in that sense works, if you want, hand in hand indeed with the actual digital euro project, which uh, the ECB and uh, the euro system are of course running and which uh, Evelyn Whitlock indeed, uh, I think, also presented to you earlier this, uh, this, this morning. Um, so from our perspective, we, of course, uh, wh why do we actually support and why we have we proposed legislation to actually introduce a digital euro, not just for the financial sector, but indeed also for the general uh, public? Um, let me just maybe mention simply two, I think, key fa features which, and factors which we see where we uh, think that as more and more citizens decide actually to go digital, to pay less with cash and more with uh, digital payments, that is a choice which everybody has. Uh, it's not something we are prescribing. And indeed, we have also proposed actually in parallel a legal proposal to anchor the so-called legal tender status of cash, so to make sure that cash continues to be accepted everywhere. Uh, but I think uh, statistically and uh, anecdotically from our work and life, we see that more and more people are actually uh, choosing to pay digitally. And uh, we think that there are in a more digital payments world, there are two key features which actually cash is providing uh, in, the, uh, in the physical world and which we do not have, unfortunately, which citizens don't have at their disposal today uh, uh, in, in the digital world when they pay digitally. And the first one, I think, is to really have a means of payment which is accepted universally across the EU. With cash, that is the case. Uh, if some of you have spent their summer holidays uh, across Europe uh, this summer, I think uh, you probably once again saw that in the digital age, unfortunately, that is not really the case, that you have something which is accepted universally, a means of payment everywhere. If you take the motorway to France, at some point, indeed, some of your cards stop to work. Uh, if you uh, happen to take a taxi in Germany, where I'm from, uh, uh, more normally than not, uh, uh, it is not possible uh, to have pay with the uh, means of Belgium payment from De Belgium, actually. So, indeed, we do not have today, or let's say, the only really universally accepted means of payment in Europe we have today is cash. Uh, and if we're moving digitally, it's important to... Um, uh, uh, to, to also have to offer this feature that will be really, really added value also for citizens. Um, and I think the second uh, uh, key point I want to mention is, is uh, privacy. Cash is not fully anonymous, but it is, uh, uh, has a very strong privacy uh, uh, profile. Um, and that is something which a lot of our citizens value uh, quite highly and increasingly highly in the digital world. Uh, so I think a digital euro, if uh, well designed, and I think that is something on which the ECB is, is working a lot and which we also support with our proposal, can really, for those citizens who want that, again, that's not everybody, but for those citizens who uh, kind of fair privacy very highly, uh, uh, can offer uh, privacy features which are quite uh, comparable and similar, up to similar to cash, uh, when we look at offline payments, for example, um, and I think that is something which today, again, is not really available in, uh, with any uh, digital means of payment. So I think those are just maybe taking two key features which are really relevant for the broader public. Uh, I think beyond that, of course, it, uh, a digital euro is, uh, 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 let's say, also important then for more financially excluded groups uh, and, and others. And I think that's also a third important feature maybe, uh, but I would maybe limit it to that. That are really the key features which we think uh, are important for a digital euro project then also to, let's say, to uh, be accepted and generally accepted in, in the European public. Okay. Maybe to follow up on that, um, we've heard uh, Governor Holtzman's speech uh, this morning and uh, his second point was that it's a good thing that uh, the digital euro obviously will have legal tender status. 
uh, but he saw nevertheless some difference between the proposed legal tender status of the digital euro and the existing legal tender status of, of cash. Do you think or do you have any knowledge of um, that that will be um, harmonized, that there will be some convergence towards those two concepts of legal tender? Yeah, I think the difficulty there is, of course, that if you ask different people across Europe what they uh, what think legal tender means, you will get very different uh, answers. So legal tender is, in, as a principle, indeed part of European law, but uh, then the way it actually works in different uh, member states and in different legal traditions is very difficult, uh, very different, sorry. And, uh, and that makes it, of course, uh, let's say, uh, difficult to, let's say, on the one hand, you have uh, traditions which have been growing over decades, in a way, on uh, legal tender, and the other hand, you have a new project, the Little Euro, which, of course, is by its nature European, and so you cannot have many different uh, uh, types of legal tender. So I think from our side, we, we try to converge those as much as possible. But, uh, uh, I mean, I think just to mention one difference which, which there is and uh, uh, which, which is uh, irrelevant, Anybody can accept cash, but to accept a digital payment, uh, you need some kind of technical equipment. And so immediately the question comes of proportionality for small merchants and others. Mm -hmm. So I think that there are some differences. Uh, one is the, div the, the different legal traditions. The other one is the different nature of cash and uh, indeed electronic payments, where maybe uh, one needs to uh, apply the same principles, but then the way they are applied, maybe some nuances are maybe justified. But I think that is certainly a discussion which will play a key role indeed in the legislative process and I'm sure the European Parliament and the Council uh, will have important views uh, on this side on that ultimately. Okay, thank you. Um, maybe Monique, I'll turn to you now. Um, well, you're the defender of the consumer's interest uh, in Europe. Um, how do you assess this proposal of Digital Euro and what are for you the key aspects um, to defend the interests of the consumers? Uh, thank you very much for uh, giving me the floor. So I'm representing BEUC, a horrible acronym, I accept that. Uh, BEUC means Bureau Européen des Unions de Consommateurs, so we are the umbrella for the national consumer organizations in Europe. Uh, we support, as a consumer group, we really support the project. We believe the digital euro is, um, is a response, addresses many of the worries and frustrations that consumers currently have with, uh, with digital exclusion and with financial exclusion, and maybe we can come back to that uh, later. What I would also like to acknowledge, and um, Evelyn mentioned that very shortly uh, in her speech, I think that the whole project has been a very inclusive process. We have had the impression, and we have been involved since the start, as a consumer group, as a stakeholder. And I can tell you, this is not standard practice. Uh, so I really appreciate that. We have had the impression that our concerns were listened to. And what I would like to say also before I speak about two key uh, mm -hmm. uh, success factors is a little bit responding to one of the questions by the citizen in the room uh, in the early session. Uh, what is there, the, the, the added value? And in fact, which something that is maybe not really stressed enough is that why has the digital euro been a project? Because we were seeing, we were observing that there was a push towards more and more a cashless society by private payment providers and that we would end up as citizens to rely totally on private uh, stakeholders to deliver us a payment service. So this is, it is key for society for citizens to still have also public money available, either in physical form or in digital form. So for us, this is a, um, it's a political project that is good for people. And that brings me to the first uh, key success factor that was also already mentioned this morning, which is communication. Uh, and I would say that um, we are in the, the months before the European elections, and this is a very good moment to communicate to the people. People have a lot of frustrations. Uh, uh, I mean, certainly uh, towards financial services, there is a lot of frustration. Consumer surveys show that uh, they are not necessarily, uh, there are, there's a lot of resignation uh, when it comes to financial services. And I think that the digital euro can be framed, uh, rightly so, as a project for the people not for the, for the financial institutions. And this narrative should be, uh, should be disseminated. Uh, now, but what is also very important uh, is not just storytelling. I think that people need to be reassured. They need to get concrete answers to their very concrete uh, questions. And I would say um, the target audiences that we want to reassure are not necessarily the usual target audiences of national banks and of um, 
policymakers. So I was wondering whether one of the key success factors for this project would not to reach out to other multipliers. I mean, consumer organizations, we will be happy to multiply the message. Huh? And also, once there is a Q&A ready, we can go for that and we will put it on our websites, and that, that's our role. But there are social workers, for example. Those are the people who will uh, uh, certainly amplify the financial inclusion part of the uh, digital euro, but they are not the usual uh, target audience for national central banks, for example. So just so, some ideas, but this is really important because for the moment we hear a lot of conspiracy theories, we hear, hear a lot of stories that are just fake news. I don't know who fuels them, not my job to find out, but still we should counteract with a positive message, but not like, uh, you know, it's not um, Teletubbies yet, huh? Uh, so we, but we need to have some sort of a story to tell that counteracts the, the fake news. That's the first key factor. The second fac uh, key factor has been already mentioned by everybody, which is uh, privacy. And please, can I say, don't tell me about GDPR. GDPR is not going to be the solution because GDPR, as long as you tick the box, they are covered. And you know that you're forced to tick the box if you want the service. Huh? Um, of, of course, we love GDPR officially as a consumer organization, but still uh, the, the system is not really functioning when you are in a, in a situation of dependence of the service that you uh, provide. And I would also like to tell Governor Holzman, please don't imitate the Chinese model when it comes to privacy, uh, because that might be uh, quite uh, worrying. Uh, this being said, um, I also think that um, we are living in a more and more digital world, nothing new there, and we as people, we as you, we all as people, are um, being exposed to more and more, uh, let's say, collecting and processing of our data. We are being tracked, we are being profiled, we, we are being AI'd, if I can say so, to see how, who we are. And there is a huge risk of surveillance by public authorities and of manipulation by private parties. So this needs to be um, addressed in a very solid and robust way when you want, if you want the digital euro to be a privacy-friendly tool. And uh, what, what I would like to say there is also because we have now open banking, open finance, it is not only about the euro system knowing what you are doing with your money. It is about all those other stakeholders that will have access to part of your data. So, so I mean, offline we see that safeguards are being built in, but online it is not just being business as usual like private uh, stakeholders, I don't, this is not enough. We need to be much more protective of, uh, of the, the privacy of, um, uh, of people, of the users of Digital Euro, and this needs, I think, still more concrete digging into how we can provide the tool to keep our privacy safe in the digital world. Okay, thank you. I, I'm beginning to see a red line here. Privacy, communication is very important. Uh, maybe I come to you, Eric. Um, your... Um, in innovation, um, chief uh, of innovation at KBC, uh, we've heard that this is a project for the people, not for the financial industry. Um, how do you look at uh, Digital Euro? What do you think are the key success factors or the uh, potential attention points? Yeah. Good morning. Um, so let me first say that, that, of course, this is a very important European product, and we need to do that because we don't want to be flooded with um, big tech money or unfriendly states taking advantage of our economy. So we really have to do it. This being said, there are some worries, I think. Um, one of the very, very tangible questions which came out of the public was, what's the difference? What's the difference? Um, and again, we have to do it, but we have to make sure that we give people a reason to switch, to change their behavior. And behavior only changes if people see a benefit. If I go back a long time ago, somebody in the bank proposed me a card, I was not working there yet, uh, proposed me a, a payment card, and I said, why should I do it? I have cash. When did I change? When I was out of gas at 12 o'clock at the night, and I said, I should have a card. Yeah? So you have to give people a reason. And at least that question indicated that people don't see the difference yet. So. There's a lot of work to do. Things have to be user-friendly, things have to be uh, supported very well, and so on and so on. It has to be easy, but also it has to have a clear benefit. That is a very, very important thing. The second thing is payments is an industry. In the banking sector, this is the closest to industry as you can get. Yeah? So that means it also follows the laws of industry. For instance, volume. Yeah? 
Um, it's good to hear that I will be able to pay in the mountains, uh, but that does not generate volume, because if I come back from the mountain, I will revert to my old habit. So I will take my cart, I will take my whatever. So it doesn't generate volume. Let me tell you a short story I, a story I had with one of the payment service providers when we were discussing about Payconic. And he said, what is the number of transactions you do? I said, yeah, currently we are at a million. And he looked at me like, I said, yeah, but in a few years, in the future, it will be hundreds of millions. He said, fine, come back in the future. <laughs> yeah, so if there is no volume, it doesn't fly. And I know there is a mandatory, there is an obligation for the banks to accept it, but not for the PSPs. Yeah. So it's very simple. Either it starts rolling, but if it stays below a certain threshold, it will not fly. It will not fly. And there are a lot of arguments. We can play with it. We can, we can make it uh, uh, mandatory and so on and so on. But it, it, is, it is really a concern. Um, law of industry support, good support. What will we do if thousands, hundreds of thousands of questions of uh, Europeans will drop into your mailbox? Something happened with my digital currency. We have to explain the very complex mechanism of waterfalling. So what happened with this? How will we answer that? Yeah, okay. Banks have to solve it. Maybe yes, maybe no. I don't know. But there are a lot of industry questions to, to, be, to be answered. And then the last one, and this is for me the, the most worrying, but it has been said before, eh? that is trust. And you can say we can make it safe, but safe is not the same as trusted. That's not the same. Because you can create panic out of the system, outside of the system. And in a world where AI is leading to a situation that I cannot trust anything anymore, who is going to provide the trust? There is a very, very powerful movement in this, what we call anti wokeists whatever. This is not a small movement. This is not a bunch of people who believe that the world is governed by snake people. This is a mainstream movement. And I, I was reading some preparation for, 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 for this. Uh, and for the first time, I saw something which I thought this could be little. It was like, we have big tech, we have big pharma, and now we will have big government. And we can assure people, you are not traced, and we can prove it with audits and whatever. But if outside of the system people start talking about this and convincing each other on social media and so on, that it is traced, and that we are going to social scoring like the Chinese are doing, then there is a big problem. And then I come to my turf. Yeah. If you take out the stabilizers of trust out of a system, then the trust is gone. And Maybe we are, banks are not liked that much, but in the reputation surveys, I see that they are still trusted. So if you want to make it a trusted thing, whether you like it or not, you will need the banks, because the banks are the only ones who can look in the eye of the people and say, you know, this is okay for you, and I can explain it, and I can explain it again. So I would say in order of appearance, the last one, the trust issue will really be a killing uh, uh, issue. So I guess for a small fee, you will bring the digital euro to your client. Definitely, definitely. Can I just react one sentence? Because you say you're the only ones l l looking into the eye of the people. For that, your branches should be open. Uh, for the moment, we only have chatbots. No. That is, well, well, okay, yeah, yeah. But that is not true. That is not true, you know. We still have hundreds of, of branches in, in, uh, in Belgium. Yeah, uh, you can count them. I, I will send you the number. We still have hundreds of branches. Why are branches closed? Because simply speaking, a substantial part of the business has been digitalized. Mm -hmm. And there is an iron law. If the people in a branch do not see customers anymore, what do you do then? Do we follow the same law as the supermarkets, as the bakers, as the butchers, as whatever? You know, this is a societal trend. And I know this is an item of the, of the consumer organizations. Eh? I know that. And there is a big debate on the ATMs. Yeah? And if my mother has to go to the bank for the ATM, it is a problem. That she, has to walk, that, that she has to bridge 10 kilometers, and she takes the bus, and she has to pay digitally. That's the situation we are in. Yeah? So that is an, sorry, we are still in contact with our customers. Last week, last week, every branch, every branch of Belgian banks was flooded with customers for the state bond. And what did the banks do? They all helped their customers, all helped their customers. So 
I don't think we are on the road to say this is only digital and get out of the, of the offices. We are reducing for economic reasons, but I don't think this is a fair statement. Okay, thank you, uh, Eric. Uh, Sylvie, you're in the acquiring and, and processing business, so I think your customers are not the consumers, but more the merchants in, 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 in the financial system. What do you believe are the key success factors, taking in mind that you're not catering for uh, consumers, but more for the, for the merchants? Thank you very much. It works, yes. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, so just maybe in a in few words, uh, in, a, in introduction, so uh, Worldline is so well known in, uh, in Belgium, but uh, regarding the, the business, so uh, yes, we, we propose uh, acquiring services. Huh? So it means a uh, uh, relationship between uh, merchants, banks, and schemes. So I think this point is also uh, important. Huh? So the capacity to address uh, scheme relationship. Uh, also, the, the possibility to, uh, to propose uh, the acceptance layer. Uh, today, uh, in, uh, in Worldline, we, we are in capacity to, to propose uh, around uh, 200 payment means uh, over the world. So, uh, Digital Euro potentially would be just uh, the, the last one or another one. Um, and also, uh, a presence uh, in, uh, in Europe uh, not only in, uh, in 20 uh, euro uh, countries, huh, but uh, uh, roughly uh, 50, uh, 50 countries uh, over the world. So again, I think it's a, it's a key point when we are talking about uh, non-euro uh, non uh, citizens uh, or other uh, people, visitors. So definitely uh, the capacity to, uh, to work with a regulator, with scheme manager, or, uh, or other uh, parties uh, in, the, in the value chain. From our point of view, um, so we are working uh, on the digital euro now for uh, roughly three years uh, from the, the public consultation. Uh, we are deeply involved in the, in the different uh, working groups with uh, the rule books, the market research, prototype, and offline. Uh, so I think that we, we have a good background and experience. And so we are not yet at the, in the middle of the bridge, huh? just at the beginning of the story. So for the, for the success of this uh, proposition, because today it's just a proposition, uh, definitely we have identified uh, three factors uh, important. First is a uh, fair level playing field. I think that uh, for, for Worldline, for PSP, uh, it will be uh, a key challenge, uh, and uh, we, we have open discussion with uh, authorities. Um, second, uh, we must capitalize on the architecture, uh, because uh, as you know, we, we are already deeply involved in, uh, in EPI, which is also uh, a strategic initiative for, uh, for Europe, and we, we support it. Uh, we have also uh, different uh, uh, digital initiative, not only in the Eurozone. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we must capitalize on the different infrastructure. And uh, thirdly, uh, the, uh, the remuneration. Uh, so I think we will discuss after. Uh, we could see on the different slides that uh, the business model should be clear. Uh, I think that the, the business model should be fair, competitive, uh, in order to, uh, to attract all the players on the chain, mm -hmm. oh, definitely. Okay, thank you. And, and if you see Worldline in this um, setup, what specific role do you think Worldline, uh, or an acquirer in general, can play um, in the ecosystem of the digital euro? Based on the, the documentation uh, today uh, available, uh, and I think that it's, uh, it's something to, uh, to be very relevant. Uh, all the documents are, are public. Uh, so I think it's a, it's a good point uh, to, to prepare the awareness. Uh, so uh, it's not a secret. And uh, so in Worldline, as acquirers, but as PSP globally, we, we have identified at minimum four key roles. Uh, first is uh, to distribute the digital euro. Uh, so we are a PSP, 
compliant with PSD2. So definitely, we are eligible to distribute the digital euro with defunding funding capabilities. Uh, second, uh, it will be the, the acceptance layer, uh, as explained, with today uh, 200 uh, payment means in catalog, uh, we can propose another one. And uh, the third one, uh, as you know, the, the acquirer is responsible for, uh, to, to collect the fund uh, uh, on behalf of the merchant, and after we will pay via a payout uh, mechanism, the merchant. So today I think that we will line, uh, we are legitimate, again, uh, based on the, the documentation, to consolidate the different digital euro transaction mm -hmm. in order to organize a payout. So it could be uh, on a daily basis, but uh, some merchants uh, today ask to receive uh, funds uh, only uh, one time per week. So it's uh, on, uh, in the contract. And uh, fourth, uh, potentially we will line, we will open also uh, a digital euro account. And uh, maybe we can collect on our account also, like an escrow account, so the different transactions after to, uh, to, to pay out the different merchants. So we, we have different possibilities. Uh, as you can imagine, we, we are working on it uh, to, to challenge uh, what does it mean. And also as a PSP and provider of, uh, of banks, uh, we, we are also in capacity to, uh, to address different uh, building blocks uh, needed for the, the back office or others. And at the end, uh, as you know, we, we, are, the, we, we are the clearer, uh, the, we have the, the clearing mechanism in the Netherlands. Uh, so potentially we could see that the euro system will settle. Mm -hmm. But the question is, uh, and what about the other clearing house? Okay, thank you. Um, Eric, uh, you're also a PSP? special one, you're a bank, so that's the, the highest category, as I may call it. So in the, proposal, the in the proposal, um, it stated that you are required to distribute the uh, digital euro, so other PSPs can uh, distribute uh, the digital euro. Um, what are you, your views on that, and what do you think will be the impact uh, on the business model of, of a bank? Mm -hmm. So for the, for the PSP, PSPs, I think the word was already out, eh? that is uh, what's in it for them, so it depends on the, on the fee structure. Um, and again, um, also for PSPs, the, the experience is that if they introduce something to the, to the market, um, they follow the trend. They are looking at, is this in my benefit, is it in the benefit, benefit of the merchant, can I have a competitive uh, advantage if I uh, hook into the digital uh, euro? I think they, they, will, all, they will all follow. Um, because it is uh, the, the, the obligation for the banking sector and, and mandatory acceptance is a very, very powerful, uh, very powerful tool. Um, but when they offer it, it doesn't mean that they will always facilitate it. So if they like it, they will, they will give it a good position. Look at, look at the ideal in the Netherlands. They managed to, to get perfectly to target the, the customer. Uh, look at bank contact in Belgium. Most transactions still online or, or bank contact because people like the brand, they recognize the brand. But if the, if the, if the, if the deal is not good enough for, for the PSPs, I think they will drag with their feet. Yeah? And of course, there's a lot of things to do in, in, in acceptance. So we are, we are talking about the toll gates in France and so on. And of course, this will be in, in, in years, I don't know how, but it, it, the experience is, the adaptation cycle is quite uh, long. Yeah? And meanwhile, customers will be confronted with, I cannot use it there, I cannot use it there. So it could be that instead of an optimistic curve, the curve goes down because people are disappointed. And if they are disappointed, merchants are disappointed, PSPs will not, at least not promote it. Yeah? Um, for a bank, there is, a, there is of course an, an obligation, um, to be honest. Um, I don't see too many bankers who shout out loud that they love the project. Me neither. Um, well, I read an article two weeks ago that said, why are they so silent? Yeah? Don't they want to speak up? Don't they dare to speak up? Are they not interested? Um, fact is that 
they are more or less, you know, like a dog sniffing. Is it interesting for me? Um, and, and, and I think that some of them hesitate, yeah, because there are some impacts. I will come back to that. For me, being in innovation, there is not a big difference between change and chance. Yeah? So for me, it's a chance. And, and we are already spinning out now what can we do with it? How are we going to promote it? How are we going to integrate it? And so on and so on. So because I want to look at it from the optimistic side, it is there, it will be there, it is the right reason that it is there. So let's deal with it and let's make it best possible user experience for, for, uh, for our customers. For the banks, it will change a lot in the balance management. Yeah, there is some, uh, uh, there was a study from the ECB, by the way, in 21, I think, what would be the effect of this 3,000 threshold on uh, uh, the bank's balances? Uh, um, what we, would be even the effect on the, on the stock market price? Because deposit-rich banks um, would suffer more than deposit-poor uh, banks. So internally, we will have to look how are we going to deal with it? What is it going to change? Um, we are already used on the ECB providing uh, liquidity, that, that is also a, a effect. But it is a different kind of, of working and it could have unexpected effects on the, on the bank's uh, balances. For instance, um, this is trusted money. Uh, uh, what happens if there is a kind of panic on a bank? Uh, and well, how will people react? You know, in the financial crisis, every bank was shaking. Um, but if this would happen, there is only one who is stable, and that is the European Central Bank. So will they move out the money? What happens with the liquidity of the bank? What is the impact on, on the ratios of the bank? What is the impact on the LCR and so on? Um, so a lot of questions to be, to be asked. The second thing is for banks, the competition will, uh, will increase. Because simply speaking, more parties will get access to funding. And so there is a possibility that we will be confronted with new um, with new uh, uh, entries in the in the market, again, that's a normal economic game. We have to learn to live with it, and we have to learn to uh, to deal with it. Um, but it will be a bit more crowded on on our uh, on our uh, playing field. Um, there are other things where we where we are looking at at this moment. For instance, uh, like cyber. Uh, as I said, it's not because it is safe that it is trusted. Um, there can, it can be that some kind of a panic is created uh, around this. Uh, how do we deal with it? How, how do we react on, on this? Um, we had a briefing last week on, on, on some methods upcoming in the cyber field of, of some Russian uh, collectives. I was really amazed what they, what they, what they are looking at. Huh? Um, so on the, the front of cyber is a, is a very important uh, thing to do. And then I'm also the, 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 the chair of, of, of bank contact. So as a, as a Belgian uh, player, um, we are very worried about the impact of the, the new uh, pricing scheme, on the, for instance, on the scheme fees. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, the offer has to be competitive, I understand that, but if this is cut out, that might be... Um, that might be a big thing for, uh, for bank contact. You might say, okay, fine, others will come. Um, but what if, meanwhile, the com competitive position of bank contact would, uh, would decline? Um, we are the ones keeping the, the, the prices cheap in, 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 uh, in Belgium. Um, we still have a very, very high market share. What would happen if, we, if this starts declining on the pressure of, of all the, the, the new measures? Um, and what would it mean for, for the ones we are defending ourselves for MasterCard, for Visa, well, how, how would they react? Yeah. Last week they announced a, an incredible price increase. Yeah. Um, we know that in all the countries where they, are in, uh, they, 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 they have grip on the, on the system, um, they, they, they also at least determine the prices. So from a point of view of bank contact, I think there is, there is a rightful worry what, what will be our role in the landscape, what will be our future. Um, and believe it or not, uh, there is some worry that, that, that we might not be able anymore to play the role we have mm -hmm. to play, and that is to facilitate our customers and to offer a cheap, uh, cheap alternative. I will come back to the pricing model, but first I, I want to go to, to Monique. Um, we already heard that um, Digital Euro will have legal tender status. Um, so this will mean that um, if there's a merchant that already accepts electronic payments today, that in the future he or she also have to accept, has to accept uh, digital Europe payments. 
Now, there is one exception, um, and that is um, smaller merchants can be exempted for accepting um, these digital euro payments. Um, what are you, your views on this? Do, do, you, do you understand this? Do you find this as a pity? Uh, um, first of all, we think it's a good idea that uh, the digital euro has a legal tender across the EU because uh, sometimes there were hurdles for people to go cross-border with their private payments uh, means. So that's good. And on the, legal, uh, on the issue about exemptions for small merchants, of course, from the consumer perspective, it would be better to have an absolute system. But we can understand that if that merchant only, uh, only accepts cash and no, no other digital payment that there can be an exemption made. So we are reasonable in our expectations. Uh, but of course, if other digital payment solutions are mm -hmm. accepted by that merchant, that should then, not, then there should be no exemption for the digital euro. Okay, thank you. Now maybe coming to the, well, the elephant in the room question, and that's the pricing model. Um, it hasn't been decided upon, but, but maybe we can try to see what already exists, what we do know. And maybe Jan, um, if the digital euro wants to be a success, um, I, it probably should come with a competitive price or a competitive fee. Um, is there already anything in the proposal on that? Uh, who will set the price? Um, what will be the determinants of the price? Um, we now have mostly classic uh, card schemes where you have four parties, you have a scheme owner, you have a well, settlement operator, you have an acquirer, you have an issuer, they all have to be paid on, on, on the fee. In the new scheme of Digital Euro, well, the scheme will be owned by the Eurosystem. Settlement will probably also be done by the Eurosystem. So I guess there are two less parties to be paid with the fees. So would that have an effect? And maybe an immediate follow-up question. Do you think it's possible or feasible that um, prices can differentiate or fees can differentiate, differentiate from one country to another so that um, when we look at the Netherlands, we have very low fees there for electronic payments. When we look at, for instance, Italy, prices or fees are a bit higher. Is it feasible that this remains also within the digital euro scheme? Yeah, thanks. I think those questions probably the answers to them you will have in 10 years' time, and probably not from us, uh, all of them. So let me just give you maybe some thoughts, uh, uh, indeed, from our perspective. Um, but it is indeed, as many of you have pointed out, a key, uh, a key, a key question, because ultimately it determines, well, the attractiveness uh, of the digital euro for those who use it, but also the incentives, indeed, as Eric has pointed out, for those who offer it and make it available to actually make it available in an attractive manner. And that is also, I think, Eric, I would be very much with you there, it is uh, also a key success factor. I mean, you can offer something in a way that is in the back of your kind of, uh, uh, of your store, and you can put it into the, into the uh, vitrine, basically. And uh, if you put it in the vitrine, it's more likely that people use it, uh, uh, even though in both cases, probably you have complied with your obligation to make it available. Um, so in that sense, um, the, I mean, the remuneration model needs to, I think, uh, uh, clearly, uh, let's say, make the euro attractive for users, for merchants to offer it, but indeed there also needs to be something in for, indeed, uh, uh, those who actually do uh, offer it, or those who actually provide the, if I can say, back office, uh, like indeed, uh, service uh, um, uh, company. Um, so um, from our perspective, uh, pricing is, is not something in which uh, uh, is, uh, the legislator or the public sector is necessarily the, be the best one to look at and to, to, to do this. At the same time, uh, of course, if you give legal tender status to a product, it's important that it is also available uh, and that there are certain principles. Uh, if you say this needs to be available and you can charge for it whatever you want, then indeed you, uh, let's say, uh, create the risk that maybe prices uh, would become too high. Uh, and that it is not offered at a competitive price. So indeed, uh, what we have proposed from the European Commission side um, in our proposal is indeed a couple of principles here, mm -hmm. that in principle, indeed, pricing of all sides should be cost-based, first of all, and uh, secondly, especially important uh, at the beginning, as maybe the actual cost base is not yet, uh, would be 
from the start uh, not super easy to, to calculate indeed that it should not be uh, uh, more expensive than comparable uh, existing means of, uh, of payment. That is an, actually an upper limit more, but, uh, but it is still, I think, uh, it is still not unimportant. So those, I think, are two principles which we have proposed to the legislator to, to establish to get to this kind of fair uh, uh, remuneration model, which I think uh, also Sylvie you mentioned and um, and others, um, and uh, I think uh, within that realm, then uh, I think it would be, uh, and I think that needs to be uh, probably still also worked out. Indeed, it would be the cooperation, uh, of course, between on the one hand the private sector and on the other hand, uh, to a certain extent, also the the ECB, who, as uh, as you mentioned, uh, would indeed have a certain role in certain of the of the rules, basically, uh, to actually uh, work out uh, more details here. I don't think. It is for the legislator to uh, uh, kind of set up a detailed scheme or a detailed kind of uh, uh, levels uh, or limits uh, on this year, um, and that's why I said we will probably still take some time actually to uh, to know the answer to this because uh, first of all the legislator needs to see whether they agree with the principles or uh, not, and then indeed I think uh, the work on the detail will probably take some for more time. Um, and then you also asked, indeed, well, is pricing something which is European or is it uh, more national? Uh, and uh, that is, indeed, I think, also not an easy one, uh, an easy question, because, indeed, uh, the, 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 uh, the principles I mentioned, the cost base may not be exactly the same across countries. Uh, and, of course, the comparison to existing means of payment, depending on where you are in Europe, may also not be exactly uh, uh, the same. Um, uh, on the other hand, if you have a European, a digital euro, a, a single means of payment, it is, uh, I mean, the, the, the obvious starting point should be where well, the pricing should be actually harmonized. So I think probably uh, we will, in this area, we may see also some evolutionary uh, developments, I guess, basically. I mean, I think one cannot disregard that the, the market structure is a bit different in, uh, in different uh, countries. Uh, I think some of the objective factors, if they are different, indeed, a single methodology may still need to different, lead to different prices and different outcomes in different, uh, uh, in different markets. Uh, uh, but uh, over time, I think uh, there should probably be an aspiration also then to, uh, to converge in this, uh, this area. But again, I, I think our proposal here only sets some general, uh, let's say, principles. And so I think uh, the details, for example, what are the exact cost structures and other matters uh, is, is indeed something then to be worked out by uh, in the first instance, of course, the market and then uh, together with the central banks. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe, Sylvie, you want to react to that? Yes. <laughs> So may, may I ask a question to the audience, just sure. to know, who works free of charge in the audience? Nobody? Okay, J just to be sure. <laughs> <laughs> so no, I, I think that uh, re regarding uh, the, the, the pricing and um, the business model uh, today in, uh, in preparation, uh, so definitely uh, it, it must be uh, rework. Uh, because uh, just to uh, just to be clear, uh, when uh, when we read, uh, there will be no scheme fee. Okay, uh, so it means that you and me, as taxpayers, we will pay the system for the settlement and the euro system. Uh, to be just clear, when we can read that there will be an uh, inter-PSP fee for the distribution of the uh, digital euro by PSP, it means that merchant will pay the inter-PSP fee, okay? And at the end, uh, regarding uh, the merchant service fee, so given that there will be no scheme fee, so the interchange fee, there will be a, a dedicated me mechanism to uh, remunerate the, the distribution. Uh, as you can imagine, we in, uh, in Worldline, but not only, uh, uh, in the different uh, acquirers, uh, acquiring company, uh, we are very surprised to read that we will have to explain, to justify our margin, and there will be a cap on this margin. So definitely, uh, it's not possible huh, to, uh, to deploy uh, a new solution free of charge um, with an ambition regarding the timeline very, uh, very high. 
so we and there is a, a competition definitely in Europe also for the payment means. Huh? Uh, as you know, uh, acquirers can be paid by scheme to accelerate the deployment of some uh, solution. So today, when the first proposal is, okay, it will be free, it will be cap, definitely, uh, as mentioned by uh, Eric, uh, not only we, we are skeptical regarding the, the success of the solution, but maybe uh, there will be some arbitration regarding the roadmap. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Maybe before going to you, I, I'll ask Eric if he wants to add to this, or has a reaction to what Jan said. Yeah, the, the, well, the discussing about, about this um, with some consultants a few weeks ago, uh, somebody said to me, you banks, you realized uh, this is a story where you are on the short end of the stick. Right? Uh, because you will have to do the heavy lifting. You will have to do the AML controls. You will have to do uh, this. You will have to do this and so on. Um, till today, there are two sources of financing this free labor. Don't target me. Still for free. Um, but there are two sources, reasons why we can do that. Interest income and payment fees. Now, interest income, we know that this is a thin line. It, uh, you have good times, you have bad times, um, but it can decline again. And the last years it was close to zero. Um, the payment fees in Belgium are extremely low, <laughs> extremely low. Um, if you take this and you look at it from an average European perspective or um, Italian perspective or whatever, um, then that means that they have more spillover effects from their income to the, the things they have to do. If the impact in the pricing is pushing so hard on the, on the margins that uh, banks would have to look for alternatives, then I think that things like AML checks and all these kind of things that they will become quite expensive. Um, so the, it will just shift. It will go from uh, uh, there's no money there. It will they, they will look for for optimization of this uh, of their business. Um, and what I'm afraid of is, of course, that that Europe will say, okay, we will look country by country, and that there are countries who have uh, a lot of income from a payment uh, uh, and 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 so on and so on. They can permit to uh, to introduce this. Um, and countries with, where the, the margins are very thin, they are, in a, they are in, a, in a difficult position. This being said, again, the way I look at it, the fact that there is a, a short end of the stick also means there is a long end of the stick. So I would like to look at the, at the long end. Uh, but definitely the, the pricing will be, will be, uh, mm -hmm. will be, an, uh, will be an issue. There's, there's no way around. Okay, thank you. Monique, and then I come back uh, to you. Yeah, j just, uh, I mean, I'm not going to give any proposal for capping anything, uh, but from the consumer perspective, if you want a digital euro to be an instrument of financial inclusion, it has to be affordable. Huh? That's the first element. Mm -hmm. Now, quite a straightforward, naive question. When there was this push towards cashless society, one of the killer arguments was that it costs so much to transport cash and to manage cash. Where has that gone? that money that has been saved. Um, I mean, it was, of course, uh, re um, how would I say, um, transferred to the retail prices. People pay for that, but that has been saved somewhere. So what has happened to that money? So can that not be recycled? I mean, we are in circular economy discussions now. <laughs> so can that not be recycled into injecting that into digital euro management? Fair point. Uh, Jan? I, I think that uh, the money has been uh, reinvested in the, in the digitalization of the of the banks or, or others. Huh? So uh, just to illustrate uh, the deployment of strong customer authentication uh, introduced yeah, by the, the PSD2 uh, needed uh, high investment in security. Uh, so uh, yeah. yeah, no, maybe a couple of uh, uh, specific points on what was raised by uh, 
um, Sylvie and also and by Eric. Um, I mean, we are not just to be very clear. Uh, we are not proposing that the, uh, banks give the digital euro for free in the sense that they basically uh, they don't earn any money. I think that's very clear. Just mm -hmm. to be uh, clear on that one, basically, uh, banks have various possibilities to make money uh, on the digital euro. Um, and even today, banks, if you do a bank transfer from your bank account A to bank account B, banks do not uh, charge any money for that. Is that for free? Well, yes, but it's not really for free because, of course, you pay uh, by in another way, basically. So our proposal does not propose that uh, anybody acts for free because, uh, indeed, uh, then we would not find many who would do that uh, well. Um, the second point then indeed, of course, it comes indeed then to how, what level of remuneration you have. And I understand that, uh, let's say, you would, are not very happy with, uh, with, uh, uh, with caps. On the other hand, uh, let's say uh, some uh, level of limitation here, given that, uh, on the other hand, the merchants basically, they, they, I mean, they're not free to purchase the service from the, they have to purchase it because we are ob obliging them to offer the deal euro. So some level of limitation here is, is probably uh, in a way appropriate. Um, and I think you also mentioned, uh, uh, CV indeed, uh, that on the cost side, the digital euro is quite different uh, to a certain extent from uh, existing private means of payment. For example, indeed, uh, there's no scheme fees. So I think, uh, let's say, the cost structure is probably something, and that's work ahead, which, which needs to be looked at much more in detail. But let's say there are, let's say, there, there are good parts, maybe there are difficult parts for the banking sector that you, for certain services you cannot charge, but there are also positive parts uh, for the banking sector. Um, and well, whether in the end you were at the short uh, uh, end of the stick or not, Eric, is an interesting one. I would say at least you have another stick to play on, basically, next to the <laughs> sticks you have today, basically, which are indeed only a small handful, a number of players, and I think you described yourself very well uh, how the market works. The less, uh, let's say, competitors uh, on the uh, uh, digital means of payments there are in a member state, uh, the more people uh, use their power to uh, raise prices. So in that end, I would say a short additional stick is still better than uh, no additional stick. Okay. <laughs> Um, thank you, Jan. Um, maybe because I'm seeing that uh, time uh, moves on. Maybe last round of questions, uh, Monique. Um, I think inclusion is very important uh, for you. So uh, we have heard many speakers today talking about financial inclusion um, with the Digital Europe project. That's one of the basic uh, elements that we want to develop. Um, how do you look at this and how do you see this evolving in the future? Do we need to do more than what we're proposing today? Well, within our possibilities, obviously. Uh, well, yes, I think it's a, it's a very important point. Um, and also maybe just to debunk uh, a few uh, myths, uh, financial inclusion is about uh, the fact that you are independent in making a payment. It's not just that you have access to a bank account. So that means that uh, you are, I mean, the system is designed in a way uh, that it is easy to use, that you don't need the help of uh, another person in order to do that. Uh, there have been surveys and, and studies and tests uh, carried out uh, that show that it's quite a high level of people who need help, support, uh, uh, in order to make transactions, digital transactions. So that's one element. The second element is we very often hear, oh, it's a generational problem, let the older one die and we will have no problem of uh, financial digital inclusion anymore. This is not true. I mean, I have all the young people in the room, I have really to disappoint you. This is not a question of generation, this is a question of age. When you get older, you are, your cognitive and your motricity skills are not the same as the one when you are 30 or even 40. Uh, and that means that uh, sometimes you need also being, I mean, it's, it's a question about being able the, the, the being having disabilities, either linked to age or not to age. So um, it is not just uh, a question that, like in 10 years' time, this problem is solved. No, we need to design a system of inclusion that takes account of all, um, let's say, um, sectors of population, also those that have less cognitive digital skills, and that uh, those skills go down with age. And I can um, witness that. Now, the, um, the, the Commission has already introduced some interesting proposals, so uh, this is certainly welcome. And uh, there is one element, but there can be more can be done. Uh, but there is one element, for example, that public entities need to organise face-to-face okay. meetings. There we are, the eye-to-eye -eye contact, uh, Eric. So uh, that's fortunately you are not a public entity, so uh, you are on the what type of stick there. Um, and so. Um, 
However, when you look at it, it's quite burdensome because if you want to have, the, uh, you, you need to get into touch with the public entity and you need to prove that you are in the category of vulnerable consumer. So that's quite red tapeish, uh, and this is something that you not that you don't like to do. When you do behavioural uh, uh, testing, people don't like to acknowledge that they have a vulnerability. So I think there we might maybe need to have a more, uh, let's say. Uh, supportive system in place that makes it much more burdensome, uh, much less burdensome mm -hmm. to try to get that advice and, and to obtain uh, that advice. So there is a lot that needs to be done there. But I would like to say, if that's the last round of questions, another very important con uh, concern for consumers is fraud management. Currently, consumers think that if they are victim of a fraud, most consumers, not all, but most consumers, that of a fraud like phishing or you know whatever, you have clicked on a link that you should not have clicked on, that the bank is going to compensate them. This is not true. I mean, there is. I mean, they might. That would be a good gesture. But there is no. Currently, there is no obligation for the bank to do so because the the fraud uh, compensation is only for credit card and uh, under certain conditions or, or, or card systems, but not for online fraud. So it is very important that that's also part of the inclusion. Mm -hmm. If you are being uh, ripped off by a by a hacker or by whatever, uh, let's say, um, thief on the on the internet, uh, there must be something that helps you. Uh, where the bank maybe or the, the, the provider can or the euro system, I don't know who, but there must be something, a system must be resilient in order to provide you with the, 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 the support needed. Well, we're now talking, it's an all other subject, but we, in the PSD3 review, we are now talking about some things like that. If uh, PSPs don't do the mm -hmm. IBAN name check, then liability shifts to the, the PSP when there is a fraudless payment going through. So. We're doing that mm -hmm. uh, in in 3 I, I guess. Let's hope it will go through. Okay, okay thank you. Um, return to the private market. Um, Sylvie and, and Eric, uh, you both are involved in um, EPI, European Payments Initiative. So that's also, or its purpose is to develop a European payment system, a harmonized European payment system. Um, today, there are four countries involved, or institutions of four countries. Um, how do you look at that from that angle to Digital Euro? Do you see uh, possible synergies? Um, do, you, do you see dangers? Can we be partners in that? Uh, what are your views on that? Yeah. Um, so, if, with this answer, I have to issue a disclaimer indeed, because I'm a board member of EPI, so uh, my answer will be colored a bit, I, I guess. Um, so let me first say that, that uh, in the board of EPI are uh, representatives of a lot of European bank. Um, and they all have only one ambition. That is to protect, protect the European economy from influences from abroad. That is the only thing which is around the table. There is a business plan, but in this case the profitability is so remote that this is not even playing. That is not a power game. The people are around the table because they think that they are true Europeans and that they have to do their moral duty, whatever. Um, this being said, it is a bit um, difficult to see that some measures which EPI could have used to accelerate uh, the go-to market, like mandatory acceptance and so on, that that is not, uh, not on the table. And so we got a lot of support, European support, um, statements, but unfortunately only statements. So this is a bit painful because basically, together with the digital euro, we are working for the same goal, that is to make the economy of Europe more resilient towards influence from outside. Um, so you know what happens when two dogs are fighting for the same bone. Yeah. So my invitation would be here, you know, um, and I know that there are talks, but my invitation would be like, let's try to combine this. Because the combination of a regulatory power, and there is a lot of power, and, and we have to to recognize that there is a lot of inventivity and a lot of know-how and so on and so on, but the combination of regulatory power and industry know-how um, could 
probably be the best guarantee that this project will work, whatever the project is, if it is EPI or it is Digital Euro or whatever. So from my point of view, it would be like, let's sit together and let's discuss again and see how we can, uh, how we can finish this job together. Okay. Sylvie, do you want to add something? Just maybe to, to complete, so fully agree on huh, what uh, Eric was explaining. So maybe two, uh, two points. Uh, so regarding the, the rollout, uh, so we, we could see that uh, the digital euro has, uh, has the ambition to, uh, for the first roadmap, for the first release, to, uh, to market not only one product, but four products, uh, the, the P2P, the e-commerce, consumer to uh, uh, governments, offline, so it, we are not just talking about one product, but uh, indirectly uh, for a solution. With, uh, with OPI, like we are in the last miles uh, regarding the, the solution. We, we are working on it now for several years. Uh, roadbooks are finished. Uh, we are uh, fine-tuning uh, specification. So I think that uh, OPI, and we think uh, that uh, OPI could, uh, could be the, the first brick and the first layer for this uh, new uh, pan-European solution. And definitely, uh, Digital Euro could be a second brick within this, uh, this wallet, uh, deployed and uh, available for uh, all the, the users and merchants, definitely. Okay, thank you very much. Um, maybe one final, sorry. Yeah, sure. I can also shortly comment on this one because indeed I think it's also an important topic for us. Uh, I mean, I think we have been, as you all know, we have been supporting indeed European payment means for, well, I would say decades actually. Uh, and in that sense, I think all initiatives, including of course the EPI, are from our side really extremely valuable and, 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 and welcome. Um, and we really think from our perspective that uh, I think the a bit uh, uh, working together with EPI but also with other initiatives as which was mentioned uh, here is, is something which is uh, desirable and, and, and possible. I mean, let's not forget uh, electronic payments is a market which is continuing to grow, basically. Mm -hmm. So it is not uh, like 20 years ago, uh, it was like this. Today it's like this, and tomorrow it will be like this. So in that sense, we see the payments market very much as something where always there was a mix between public and private means of payment. And that's the added value, of course, of a digital euro is that it keeps the public share in the, in the, uh, in the digital age. And I think, Monique, you, you mentioned how important this is for consumers but also, of course, for central banks. That's why it has a unique kind of uh, feature, uh, uh, but uh, it is never, uh, and it's not, and I think that you will be the first one to say that, it's not, of course, intended to take over the, the, the market. So we see very much really this uh, kind of, uh, uh, this uh, coexistence and cooperation as well as a, as a positive uh, perspective. And indeed, our proposal also suggests and proposes that indeed the digital euro design should be uh, done in a way that is indeed interoperable with private payment solutions, both building on what is already there in terms of standards, but also enabling what is done for the digital euro to be indeed also open and reusable for open private initiatives in a way. I think that's uh, the way we would see the interaction from our side, and it is a topic on which we uh, have and I continue to think a lot because uh, it, is, it is essential, this public-private, let's say, co cooperation more than coexistence indeed. Okay, thank you. Maybe one final question to you, Jan. Um, we have talked about uh, the legislative proposal. Can you say something on the, the timeline? What's next? Yeah, on the, on the legislative side, this is now very much in the hands of the European Parliament and uh, the Council of Ministers. Uh, so uh, they have now started the work. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the first working group has started in, uh, in the Council and some, I think, attaches are here as well uh, in the Parliament. And again, I think some colleagues I have seen, uh, a rapporteur has just been, I think, uh, uh, appointed. Uh, so, uh, I mean, by experience, a legislative process takes a bit of time and I think it's also time needed to properly reflect on this project uh, from the legislative side. Um, so, uh, I mean, you, you know, but it's not for us then to decide how much time that is. That's for the legislator. You know, if you look at past uh, legislative files, this can be between one uh, years, two years, and it, uh, I mean, it is up to, uh, uh, I mean, much, much more than that, depending on how important the legislator thinks the file is, basically. But for the time being, we see a good engagement, so I think we are confident that indeed uh, the legislators uh, will kind of uh, drive forward the file. Any chance it will be voted before the elections? This is really not for us to, okay. to decide. The Parliament has just appointed their rapporteur, so uh, I, I, 
I think it will really, and I'm not even sure the European Parliament has already uh, made up their mind on the, on the schedule. They will now need to have the different groups sitting together and discussing, uh, and then I think we'll have to hear from them. Okay, thank you. Um, I think uh, we've talked already uh, very much and maybe enough, but we'll not stop before we give you, the audience, the chance to uh, raise your questions or ask what you want. So uh, again, there are microphones if you want to uh, ask a question, please be brief, state your name and um, possibly your organization and also to whom you want to ask the question. The first gentleman that raised his hand is right in my middle. Can we have microphones, please? Here in the middle. The gentleman. Thank you very much. Rudiger uh, Foss, European Commission, not working on the digital uh, euro. The question Is there any chance that at the very end we'll have a system where I can use, as a private person, the digital euro without Visa card, without MasterCard, especially because I don't like it? The client of MasterCard and Visa card, if they are fined hundreds of millions for abuse of a, do of a dominant position. Or take the example, the organization of the uh, Olympic Games in Paris are full in the hand of Visa card. You cannot pay with something else. Well, I suppose you ask that question to me as <laughs> central banker, um, and the short answer is uh, yes, that's exactly what we want to achieve. Yes, the gentleman over there, and then I'll come over here. Thank you. Uh, I'm Antonio Garcia del Riego from the European Economic and Social Committee. Uh, congratulations, first of all, for organizing uh, this um, debate and this uh, seminar. And second, um, a question um, uh, following the comments made by Mr. Lutz um, regarding um, the impact uh, that digital euro could have on the deposit base of uh, banks. Um, obviously, um, the deposit base of banks uh, is the, one of the main uh, source of funding for uh, lending. And this is particularly uh, the case for those institutions, normally small or medium, that depends solely on deposits. So, the question is, the impact assessments that uh, the Commission and I guess that the European Central Bank have already undertaken are considering the impact on the financial stability of uh, a European economy that today depends up to 70% on bank lending and that is particularly uh, significant for uh, SMEs, for consumers that don't, don't have access to other source of uh, funding. They cannot have access to capital markets, they cannot issue equity, they cannot issue debt. So, the impact on lending and on financial stability that the digital euro could have on the funding base of uh, the financial system. Thank yeah. you. So, um, the note I was referring to, and I'm sure that you all know this uh, note from, uh, it was March 21, I think, uh, when, when the impact was studied. In fact, in that uh, study, there were three scenarios. Um, one of them was unlimited, uh, so no holding limits, uh, an unlimited issue. Uh, and then, in, I think in that study, this limit of 3,000 holding limit was, uh, was uh, mentioned as a preferable scenario. Um, and then I think, I guess the conclusion was, if I summarize the, the, the paper, that this is doable, this is feasible. Uh, um, it has some impact on the economic models of the, of the banks, but um, it would be, it would be, as I said, it would be feasible. Don't forget that also in the previous years, banks were more or less depending for their liquidity on the European Central Bank. There was a TLTRO program and so on and so on to stimulate the economy. Um, so I think that, that um, uh, even though when I, I had some, need some time to digest after reading that study and started discussing with the people saying what is the impact, what, is the, what do we need to have to do and so on and so on. Um, 
And as I said, the European digital euro has to be there. Um, so I think it will be, it will be okay. -ish. So we can handle that. Um, I think that the, the, the ECB will find mechanisms to uh, provide banks with sufficient liquidity. I, I think that we need to think still about the stress scenarios, what happens then. Um, it will change things fundamentally and some banks basically are worried that they would be converted into lending machines. Yeah. Um, which would, which might have two effects. Credits become more expensive or they might become more cheap because there is more standardization in the supply of, uh, of liquidity. So it's more stable, it's, it's, a, it's a regulator who is providing. Um, so the combination of the two, I think that, that, that um, given the importance of the digital euro, this is, well, it's not up to me to, to, to suggest a, a limit, but I think this is well studied and well balanced and, and, and it will hurt some of the more deposit rich banks, but I think that, that this is acceptable. Well, yeah. If I can maybe just add two words. I mean, I think one item is uh, the impact on the banks will not depend indeed on the success of the digital euro, but on actually how much would people use it also as a store of value to hold money on their accounts. And I think uh, uh, depending on the design, actually uh, you can have a successful digital euro without very high holdings. And uh, we can go to detail with the waterfall mechanism and everything else. But indeed, uh, uh, I think uh, the, the design, the way I think also it is uh, uh, proposed by the ECB indeed does everything to limit actually the, the amount of holdings you need to use it in a successful manner. Um, and I think uh, the second point was also relevant. Of course, holding limits are important, but uh, uh, let's say what is maybe more important are the economic incentives. Uh, let's say uh, we have proposed, and again, I think quite in line with also the reflections a bit in the uh, area of the central banks, that indeed, uh, normally the digital euro should not uh, bear interest in a way. Uh, and I think that will naturally limit uh, uh, wherever you are, if uh, you are in a country where 3,000 euro is a lot or where you're in a new country where it's not a lot, it will naturally limit the uh, kind of uh, the tendency of people to put a lot of money uh, away from the banks on the uh, digital euro accounts, basically. And so we hope with those incentives and with the design in the end, you can have a system where actually there will be very little holdings and so very little impact on the balance sheets, even if it is successful as a means of uh, payment. Mm -hmm. And can I maybe add to that? I don't expect uh, 400 million consumers taking immediately uh, action. Huh? So it will be a very progressive take up by people. They will first have you know, the early adopters and then uh, the others will follow. Huh? So it will not be a revolution from one day to the other. So I think there is time to adapt. Uh, and to complete the, the picture, the, uh, there will be a zero limit holding for the merchants. Uh, so uh, I think it's also uh, a key point. So we, we are just talking about uh, as mentioned, Monique, uh, potentially uh, just, uh, and we are just talking about Eurozone. Uh, so uh, again, so not the merchant in the scope, the Eurozone. So uh, at the end, uh, we are talking uh, maybe uh, roughly uh, 100, uh, 150 million people that will use on a daily basis such topic, such solution. Yes, Dominique Carlier, European citizen, and I'm running a very, very small company. Uh, first, you refer a few times to 3,000 euros. I think there's a reason, a legal reason, because if I don't make a mistake, in Belgium it's forbidden to pay in cash something more than 3,000 euros. So S digital euro will be exactly the same as cash euro. If you use more than 3,000 euros in digital euros, you trespass the law forbidding to pay in cash or in equivalent uh, anything because of, uh, it's a fight against the uh, washing, okay, le blanchiment d'argent, sorry. Uh, but my question is really back to basics. If I want to have digital euros, I must first have euros somewhere of course, on my bank account, logically. So, how will I transfer the digital, euro, the digital euros when they are on my bank account to something to have digital euros that I can carry? It cannot be an app or whatever because it has to be possible to use them offline. 
Of course. I don't know really your boss jobs because I still have this finger kind of thing and I'm really glad to have just a dumb phone. In English I say dumb phone because it's not a smart, it's dumb. So, uh, and second, how will I carry this digital yours? I have, I must have this digital yours with me to be able to use them and if I can use them offline, they must be somewhere on me that no, does not necessary, necessitate a line, a connection online to use it. Actually, at the moment, you can pay contactless, but if you pay contactless, you still need a connection between the merchant and a bank because you don't have to pin your code, but you need to have this uh, US on your bank account so that the merchant gets them. So how will you, it be? And in the past, something existed. In Belgium, it was Le Proton, Les Cartes Proton. It's a long time ago. It was only 25 euros, but I found it very, very useful. When I went to the baker or news agent, I paid two or three euros. Now, either I pay in cash, I have to, either I pay for my bank account. And if I do it by my account, I have a list like that at the end of the week because three euros for it. I don't, and I never had a clear explanation why Porton Card was cancelled because it was digital euros on an offline system. So, in fact, you are talking now for larger amounts to do again what existed more than 10 years ago that worked very uh, well and that was cancelled. I think it's what the bank who decided to cancel it, but I never heard, and I think it's a pity. Um, this goes to the design of the digital euro, so if my panelists are comfortable, I will say something about it, but I leave Eric well, to talk about Proton. I, I, yeah, well, I, I, I think I have to answer the question on, on, on Proton. Uh, I, I agree with you that it was a very nice, uh, very nice system. Um, and I must admit that this parallel with the digital euro has been made also uh, a month ago to me, so uh, that's correct. Um, unfortunately, the system was not profitable. So the number of volumes was not high enough and it were very small amounts and it was actually not possible to bear the cost of the, of the transaction and that is the reason why it was, uh, was cancelled. So and then maybe to go back to uh, the design features. So we saw in Evelyn's presentation that the offline usage was one of the key features of the digital euro. Uh, we will provide for two form factors. So you will have a phone and probably a card and it will be able to do the settlement offline. So then we have to go back to what we call secure elements. So these are pieces of microchips or whatever that can do the settlement um, offline. So you don't need a third party online to settle that transaction. Can this go on endlessly? Obviously not. Um, the, this is a chain and some, at some point in time, this chain has to be settled with the general ledger. Uh, so, at one point in time, you probably need some kind of connection to settle uh, your volumes within the general ledger. But uh, for a few transactions, um, or even more transactions, uh, we expressly uh, want to cater to the offline users, and we will refer to secure elements to do the, um, the settlement offline. So, you don't need to have a bank account to pay peer-to-peer, -peer. you don't need an internet connection to pay peer-to-peer, -peer. the settlement will be offline. And if I understood it well, you don't need a bank account to charge. No, so that's another point. So also in Evelyn's um, uh, presentation, um, there is the possibility, I think that's also in the proposal, that you can, um, well, deposit cash through some kind of dedicated machine on your, in your digital euro wallet. Just maybe to, to complete, because in, uh, in Worldline, so we are uh, first regarding uh, Proton, so you are Belgium, I'm French, we, we face the same story uh, with uh, Moneo in, uh, in Germany, uh, Gelkart, in the Netherlands, uh, Shipnik, if I'm correct. Uh, so uh, definitely all the countries already experience uh, uh, offline. And as explained by Eric, the, the business model didn't fly. So again, um, if I can, can I mean that's exactly one of the elements where there's a difference between purely pri private means of payment and then something public. Because indeed, of course, private means of payment ultimately need to, I mean, 
nobody can, no company can afford to make them available if they don't pay off. Whereas, indeed, if there's a public obligation and a requirement, as will now be the case for the little euro, indeed, then, indeed, you can say, well, no, this is so important for uh, society, for citizens, uh, data protection, that, indeed, it needs to be made available. And, and just regarding the, the process and the, the techniques behind the, the solution, so uh, uh, in Worldline, now we, uh, we experiment the, the offline prototype, and definitely uh, it will be mandatory to have access to your secure element uh, to, to manage offline. So it means, and uh, I think that many people in the, in the audience experience uh, between uh, 2005 and uh, 2015, when we discuss uh, how to implement uh, contact list and uh, payment with your mobile phone. So many, many discussions during 10 years. And one day, a guy named uh, Apple came with a solution and he found it, okay? Um, so definitely for Digital Euro offline, discussion with provider, manufacturer of mobile phones will be mandatory. Mm -hmm. Without such results, without such solution, with these manufacturers, they will never be offline. Just to be, to be clear. Other questions? Yes, please. Thank you. I'm Martina Weimert, the CEO of EPI. Um, I have the question, I mean, it's obvious now in the design, at least from what we know now, that it's an intervention on the level playing field. A subvention business model, whether we like it or not, and I can understand why you do it, but in an intervention in level playing field, which is always dear to the commission. And on the other side, mandatory acceptance is an intervention in the level playing field. I can understand all this, but to be honest, for us from the private sector and with all my shareholders, the impression that we have is that we think that this will solve the problems, that this is the unique recipe. I think that is something which we see also happening in China, where the same kind of principles are followed, and nevertheless, it's not a success. So our appeal is really on the cooperation, and we have always been very open to this cooperation, and through the prototyping have proven that we are willing to cooperate as many other players, and I think it will need many other players. So it's not to say it should be only EPI or whatever, but I think um, the cooperation with the private sector and having in mind what intervention in the level playing field in the market means, it means that it comes across like for merchants, and I get this comment now every day that we are competing, this is harmful because going back to the principle that you were mentioning at the beginning, which was, well, we want something to make Europe great again and to stand up against the American. It cannot be that we start by, well, we are competing amongst Europeans. We need to find this way of cooperation and we need to find a fair marketplace for all players and not just, well, we're intervening now and then we hope that this will solve all the corruption. So it's not more a question, it's just a statement because I'm listening since this morning and honestly it was an urgent need for me to express also the view of a, another European perspective. Okay, thank you. You want to? Yeah, no, I mean, I think it, it, is, it is indeed uh, clear that uh, public money is indeed an intervention. It is not on a level playing field with private uh, actors. I think that's the very purpose of public intervention, and that's why it needs to be well justified. And I think that's exactly the discussion which indeed is being, being had. I think hundreds of years ago, uh, people felt that there is a need for public money uh, in, the, in the analog age. Uh, and I think the question is today, is there a need for public money and for that intervention also in the digital uh, age uh, and for public money available to retail customers? That's, I think, indeed the discussion we have. Um, so in that sense, we recognize, I personally recognize that it is, of course, uh, an intervention and it is not about a strictly level playing field. 
Uh, that being said, and I think uh, there, I think I would agree with almost everything you, you said in a way, uh, and we discussed it before, it is essential that of course there is a public-private uh, partnership and cooperation. Um, and from our side, maybe we are a bit more optimistic that uh, this can actually also work and that the digital euro can also indeed, does not have to go against actually a private uh, means of payment, but that indeed uh, there can be synergies uh, and uh, uh, that actually in any event it is a market which is growing, so there will be quite a lot of space for many uh, actors. Can, can, can I just second yeah, that? Sure. I would like to second that because we really believe that uh, having a digital euro is addressing a market failure. The market has not delivered to consumers what consumers expected. And so therefore this intervention was needed for us. And, and maybe just to follow up on what's been said in the presentations we saw uh, this morning. Um, the ECB does its space study every now and then, and um, when we go, let's say, uh, six to seven years back, then we saw that uh, almost 80% of point-of-sale payments in the Eurozone were made in cash, 78%. Um, if we look at the latest space study, that percentage has dropped to around 50, on average in the Eurozone 50. So that means that the central banks have lost 30% of market share over six years. That market share has gone to private players. Now we are just following up on an evolution that we see in society, namely that everything is digitizing, and we have to follow. We have to provide for digital public money um, because that's our duty. Um, we haven't heard uh, the term monetary anchor today. It's the first time that's been, that's been used, but this is important. I know that I'm not going to convince any citizen or merchant with that argument, but it is important that we do have a digital version of uh, public money just to play that role of the monetary anchor uh, for uh, commercial bank money. So I understand that um, when you make certain types of payments mandatory acceptable, uh, that that can be viewed as, um, well, that, that's an unleveled playing field. But I do think that, um, well, the market share that uh, private players are now having in, in, in payments is, is gone up uh, by several tens of percents uh, the last few years. So, um, and I do believe that we're only going to take back a very small portion of that. Evelyn? Yeah, thank you. So, um, the two points from my side. Uh, so, I think we need to be aware if we talk about level playing field, we, we're comparing apples and pears. Uh, because of it, it, uh, the digital euro being public good, there are also things that the digital euro cannot or would not do because of the fact that it's a public good, just to, to be sure that it's not one on one. Uh, and secondly, we have been very Vocal and, uh, and and I do it again that we really would like to cooperate and to be in a, in a constant dialogue and to further find solutions. So, um, if the if the idea is uh, here that that's not the case, then I would like to correct that because we have done this in bilateral interchanges and in uh, in the more formal one. But let me do it again. We're very open for a further dialogue. Uh, and to see how we can incorporate. And we were very happy with EPI contributing in the prototyping, for example. So I um, wanted to add that to the discussion. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, maybe just on, the, on this point, so we, we could see in the proposition that uh, interoperability with the ID wallet should be in, okay? So maybe we can change by interoperability with a PE. Huh? So I think that uh, it could be a, a, a strong signal that uh, uh, because well, we, we are introducing uh, many projects, the wallet on uh, ID, the wallet on digital euro, there, are the, there is uh, the private initiative, and on the text we could see that cooperation, interoperability is possible with the uh, uh, EID wallet. So question is, was to mix ID and payments, and why not to Exactly as it's uh, mentioned in the retail payment strategy, mm -hmm. it was clearly identified that uh, EPI and uh, was uh, was among the, the solution to develop with a digital currency. So we are talking about payments. So maybe we we could uh, restore uh, a synergy. 
Yeah. I mean, I, I think actually what, you, what you're suggesting is in the proposal in a way. We have two articles. One is uh, on interoperability with uh, the European Digital Identity Wallet, and the other one is indeed uh, about the interoperability with, uh, uh, let's say, private uh, standards and uh, rules concerning private means of payment, uh, basically. Um, the one thing I think, uh, and that I think you can understand, uh, uh, European legislation cannot say is it needs to be oper interoperable with one specific private, uh, let's say, uh, operator. APE is, of course, a special operator, but it's still a private operator. So in that sense, I think the European legislation can only refer, indeed, in general terms to, let's say, uh, open and uh, existing standards. But I think that is already there, because I think that's exactly as uh, indeed Evelyn also suggested. It's something which is quite dear to us, indeed, to, uh, to work on this interoperability. OK. I propose that we take one last question, if there's is any? No, there's not. So, okay, then um, I would like to ask you to join me in thanking uh, my panelists of today, Monique, Sylvie, Eric, and Jan. It was very insightful. Uh, thank you for the different angles that you brought to this debate, and uh, thank you very much. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, um, we are now gradually coming to the end of this conference and I now have the difficult task of um, keeping your interest for a while to try to summarize the uh, keynotes and interventions um, of this morning in just a few key messages. And what's more, um, I have to do so on an unleveled playing field since my competition is your lunch, but I will try nevertheless. So first, let me thank um, our keynote speakers of today, uh, Evelyn and uh, Petia, and also our panelists, uh, Sylvie, Monique, Eric Lutz, and uh, Jan. And if there's one common point I take away from uh, their interventions is that the Digital Euro is a particularly large and complex project. Um, the ambition of the digital euro is to be an easy to use, safe and secure means of payment with a very high level of privacy that can be used by anyone in just about any circumstance, offline and online, free of charge for citizens and at extremely competitive fees for merchants. And it wants to do all of this without any impact on financial stability. So I think, I think uh, it should be stressed that the importance of this project cannot be underestimated. Um, we are charting here the course our common currency will take for the future. And the digital euro as a central bank digital currency would constitute a major next step in the history of money in our society. Just as when banknotes were when they appeared the first time. And the parallel with uh, banknotes is not coincidental. Um, the, this new stage in the development of our means of payment should indeed mark the introduction of a hybrid payment instrument, combining the features of banknotes with those of private means of payment. And which would also be adapted to a changing and increasingly digital world. In addition, the digital euro should be able to meet future payments like machine-to-machine uh, -machine payments in relation to Industry 4.0 or even uh, conditional payments in relation to the decentralized Web 3.0. And the decisions that already have been made and are yet to be made in the course of this project will effectively prove vital towards answering questions of the future relevance of pu public money. And we therefore need to take our time and consider thoroughly which form, characteristics, and functionalities our digital euros should have once they land in our virtual wallets. And let me briefly reflect on some of these key design features 
um, that have been decided so far and that I think are mentioning um, word. The digital euro, just like cash, should be available offline, enabling end users to make payments even when they do not have an internet connection. And by allowing customers to make transactions offline, the digital euro would increase the availability, the accessibility, and the resilience of the payment system in Europe. The importance of this functionality cannot be underestimated, as it would provide consumers with a novel experience and functionality unavailable to them anywhere in the private market today. The digital euro would also play a strong role in tackling digital exclusion in our societies. As we digitize in an ever-increasing speed, quite a few people are increasingly left behind. And the digital euro would cater to them to ensure they can obtain equal access to a digitized means of payments through, for example, their local post offices. Moreover, I am convinced that the confidentiality and the end user's financial data is key to the success of this project. However, reasonable safeguards against illicit activities such as anti-money laundering or sanctions evading should be put in place. So data privacy is key and it has been put front and center by the Commission in its legislative proposal on Digital Euro. The offline mode will offer greater confidentiality with a level of protection comparable to that of withdrawing banknotes from a cash machine. And just like cash as well, delivering the digital euro into your pockets will need the involvement and the cooperation of financial intermediaries. Both banks and payment and e-money institutions should be involved. And indeed, the ability for these intermediaries to build on top of digital euro with solutions such as conditional payments is a key aspect. It would allow European players from the smallest to the largest to innovate with payment solutions built on top of a product that will already have scalability throughout the euro area. And I'm happy to report that the euro system has already studied these and many other design aspects during its investigation phase in the past two years. In fact, most of them have been touched on this morning. And the maturity of our discussions therefore lead me to believe that we are now ready to take this project into a new phase, more in tune with the nature of our conjectures. Now, what would that new phase look like? And let me start off by saying that we are not yet near the question of issuance of a digital euro contingent upon the Governing Council's approval, hopefully next month, the Euro system would launch a preparation phase that itself would consist of two parts. Initially, the first part would stretch for a minimum of two years and seek first of all to finalize the Digital Euro Scheme rulebook. And this rulebook will be faced with the difficult task of building on the various opinions heard today about the roles the interactions and the rules relating to the use of and the implementation of a digital euro. And obviously, it should uh, be consulted with the market and an adoption plan should be foreseen. Secondly, a better view on the components of the digital euro service platform that is to be tendered, as well as on which entities, private or public, get to service them should be part of this first phase. And then furthering the project into the second part of a preparation phase, the actual development of the digital euro service platform, as well as the testing of the digital euro, can occur. And this is slated to take several years. And again, contingent upon governing council's approval and, of course, the legislative package, uh, we do not anticipate a digital euro in your vertebral wallet until the year 2027. And speaking of the uh, legislative package, uh, let me take the opportunity also to underline the ongoing, all-important negotiations with the Council and the Parliament in relation to the initial proposal we saw published end of last June. And we have had the pleasure uh, today 
well, hearing from uh, Jan Seysens, explain the Commission's point of view during the panel. And I cannot but underscore the fact that we need a, r a really strong legal underpinning before contem contemplating any issuance of a digital euro. And in my view, it also needs no reiteration that this new form of our common currency could not be envisaged without the thorough democratic debate that this legislative proposal provides. At the same time, we must ensure that this democratic debate takes place based on correct information and safeguard the discussion from misinformation, deliberate or otherwise. And we all have a role to play in spreading factual information and countering the forces of fake news. Ladies and gentlemen, um, to sum up, the potential issuance of a digital euro would signal the euro system's firm commitment to ensuring that money, as it always has throughout our long history, will continue to evolve in lockstep with the societies it serves. Money has an important societal, social component to it, and as our societies are undeniably on the verge of full digitalization, our role as central bankers is to preserve access to public money. That means ensuring a continuous, uh, continued access to cash, but also it means that ensuring that public money remains fit for purpose. In other words, that public money can continue to play a relevant role as a means of payment in a digitized world. A digital euro should therefore not replace cash. It should not even be a success by any commercial mean or standards. Its goal is not to conquer the biggest market share in digital means of payment, but to always be there as an option for consum consumers and merchants, regardless of the payment situation they find themselves in or where they are in the euro area. And I sincerely believe that to flounder in this task of future-proving our common currency would be to relinquish a core part of our duties as central bankers. I, from my part, look forward, therefore, to the next phases of this project and to safeguarding the future of the euro for the digital era. Thank you very much. So I have now a few service announcements. Um, when you leave the room, there is lunch served in the two rooms outside of the auditorium, so I think it's already ready. So please have a great time together networking with each other and um, see you next time. Thank you. <laughs>